Welcome everyone to my limited set review for Dominaria United. This set review will focus on the limited format, so mainly draft, and I'll also mention some cards that might have constructed applications along the way. As usual, you can find all my set reviews in some handy spreadsheets that you can access either if you're a Twitch subscriber or a Patreon supporter, and on these spreadsheets you'll have all the card ratings that we'll go over today, as well as the ratings for previous sets I've uh, covered, and these ratings will also be kept up to date as I play the set more. I'm sure some of these ratings will change over time as I get more experience with the set, and it's normal for some uh, ratings to fluctuate a little bit as we play the set more. And then before we get started, I'd like to give a quick overview of how I like to rate my cards. So I'll be using a letter grade system, going from S, which is the best, all the way down to an F, which doesn't come up a whole lot nowadays. And the S tier is reserved for ridiculous bombs. Taking a look at Streets of New Capenna, Sanctuary Warden is a great example of one of these ridiculous bombs, a card that has an immediate impact when it enters the battlefield usually, is often tricky for the opponent to remove, and even if they do somehow manage to remove your bomb, it's still gonna have a lasting impact on the rest of the game. So that's an S tier card, and there's not many of these in each limited set. Next we have the A, these are still bomb level cards, Workshop Warchief, a great example of a card that has a nice impact when it enters, and is kind of just a great value card, and in this case also if it gets answered you can still get some nice value from it. We've got the Hostile Takeover, Sweepers will often end up in the A category, as they're very impactful cards in a game of Limited. And these are often just rares and mythics, both the S and the A grade. Very rarely do you see an Uncommon in the A tier. Next up we've got the B tier, these are great playables, and if you're playing a draft these are cards you're absolutely ecstatic to still first pick in a pack, so it's pretty rare that you actually open a, an A level card or an S tier level card, but the B tier cards are still great playables, and often the best commons in each color will fall in the B tier. So taking a look at Murder from Streets of New Capenna, one of the best common uh, rarity removal spells in the set. Another one is Inspiring Overseer, which could have easily been an uncommon in Streets of New Capenna just because of how powerful it is. So often two for one creatures will fall in the B tier, so these are often the best commons in each color, as well as a lot of uncommons and a couple rares. Then the C plus category are the very good playables. These are cards you're very rarely going to cut from your limited decks if you're playing those respective colors. Mayhem Patrol, a nice example of a great two drop that still has a nice impact in the late game. So that's often what I'll be looking for in my C plus tier is if my two drop still has some utility in the late game, so it's not simply a 2-2 sitting on the battlefield doing nothing. And I'll also sometimes put some of the more conditional or slightly more expensive removal spells in the C plus category. Whack, for instance, not quite as efficient as murder most of the time, so it gets a C plus. Then the C tier are decent filler cards. These are still fine playables, sometimes they'll get cut because you have too many of them and you need to make a choice. I'll also usually put combat tricks in this category, since there's only so many of them you want in your decks, so you shouldn't be prioritizing them during the draft but Antagonize is totally fine, and if you're playing an aggressive deck you're usually happy to have one or two of these. And some of the less exciting two drops and creatures in general might fall in the C category, and again there's going to be a ton of these throughout any limited set. Then the D tier are the bad filler cards. These are cards you're probably going to cut from your limited decks more often than not. So the Crocodile being an example, just a little bit inefficient, and expensive to get down and doesn't necessarily have the impact you want once it's in play, so that might get a D, so a card you will cut from your deck more often than not. And Broken Wings also falls into the D tier, and sideboard cards will often fall in the D tier as well. Even the Broken Wings might be fine in some matchups, you're typically not going to main deck it, but having access to it in the sideboard is still very nice if you're playing best of three, so sideboard cards often get a D as well. 
And then finally we've got the F tier. And as I've said, nowadays you don't get a whole lot of F tier level cards in Limited, just because they're often more cards meant for constructed. You might see some constructed sideboard cards or cards referencing planeswalkers, which you just don't see very often in Limited. So those might get an F as well. So that's my grading system that I'll be using for this Limited set review. Next up, I would like to take a look at various archetypes and color pairs in Limited. Now, Dominaria United is a little bit strange in that regard, because the color pairs aren't quite as strict as they might have been in a different set. And if we take a look at just the individual colors, this is kind of the breakdown of what each color is kind of all about. We've got white caring about making lots of tokens, going wide, and having cards that benefit from controlling lots of creatures. Blue, in general, cares about casting lots of instants and sorceries, non-creature spells, and benefiting from those. Whereas black cares about destruction and sacrifice. Red, typically a very aggressive color, so you want to be a low-curve aggro deck when playing red for the most part. And then green introduces a mechanic called Domain, which cares about controlling lots of different basic land types. And there is a cycle of common lands that have two basic land types each and come into play tapped. So this will be a big part of the green archetypes that care about Domain. And then if we expand the one color archetypes to two color, we get the following list. So blue-white cares about going wide and pairing it with instants and sorceries. Red-white is a go-wide aggro deck, so you're going to make a bunch of tokens and then maybe pumping them up and giving them other bonuses. Blue-black turns into kind of this control deck, so you're just going to have a lot of removal spells and maybe some threats to close out the game. Black-green turns into kind of a mid-range graveyard deck that has a lot of graveyard recursion to get creatures back out of the graveyard and sort of outgrind the opponent that way. And then red-green is a pairing of domain from the green color, as well as some of the aggro elements from red. But red also has a few domain cards, so red-green kind of a mix. Again, these color pairs aren't very strict, you can easily end up in more than two colors in the set, because there's quite a bit of mana fixing between all the dual lands, and green especially has a lot of mana fixing. So these are just a guideline to give you an idea. Then blue-red, on the other hand, cares about casting lots of instants and sorceries, pairing it with cheap removal spells out of red, perhaps. Has a few flyers as well in blue to close out the game, and a lot of the blue-red gold cards, as we'll see, also benefit from casting instants and sorceries, which you're pretty used to by now. Then black-white has a bit of a life gain, sacrifice, go white theme, maybe having a few overlapping synergies with the red-black as well, which also cares about creatures dying, so you might end up in maybe a black-white-red color pair that has uh, most of those sacrifice and death synergies, but uh, red-black may be slightly more aggressive and caring less about going wide, of course. And then uh, green-white cares about going wide as usual, but also has a few more domain synergies. And finally, blue-green is the color that cares most about ramping, just casting lots of expensive kicker spells, and kicker also makes a new appearance here in Dominaria United. So that's going to be one of the reasons to ramp, is to cast the more expensive kicker cards and benefit from those. So these are the two color pairs, and now we're ready to dive right into the review, starting with the multicolor cards. And our first one is a pretty powerful one, a Johnny Sleeper Agent. This has Phyrexian mana, so we can potentially pay two life instead of paying the green or white Phyrexian hybrid mana, meaning it's potentially a three drop, and I think most of the time is going to be a three drop. Enters with four loyalty, and then we can plus one to provide card advantage by revealing the top card of our library. If it's a creature or planeswalker, we can put it into our hand. Otherwise, we can still decide to put it on the bottom. So if it's a land, for instance, in the late game, we can still get rid of it so we don't have to draw it. And then a minus three, which we're often going to use right away, lets us distribute three plus one counters and give vigilance to those creatures as well. So a very impactful effect, if you have somewhat of a board presence, of course. And then the minus six out of nowhere says you get an emblem, saying whenever you cast a creature or planeswalker spell, target opponent gets two poison counters. And as you may know, if the opponent gets ten poison counters, they lose the game. So that's an alternate win condition. 
So if you can get to the ultimate, then cast five creatures or uh, planeswalkers and you win the game. So a journey is great and uh, easily gets an A, a bomb level card. And uh, even without the ultimates, you can get a ton of value out of uh, a journey. Next we have Aaron Benalias Ruin, 3 mana for a 3-3 a legendary Phyrexian human in black-white, has menace, so already just a 3-3 menace for 3 isn't too bad, and we can also pay a black and a white, tap it, and sacrifice another creature to put a plus one plus one counter on each creature you control. So we can just sacrifice a bunch of tokens to pump up the rest of our team, as we mentioned, Black White cares about going wide and sacrificing, so this fits that game plan perfectly. So Aaron, a pretty decent card as well, and a nice way to kind of get started in the Black White archetype. So you could take it early and try and build around it, and get a B. Then we have Astor, Bearer of Blades, 4 mana, 4-4 four, four legendary human warrior at rare. And when it enters the battlefield, you get to look at the top 7 cards of your library and reveal an equipment or vehicle from among them and put it into your hand, and the rest on the bottom in a random order. And then equipment you control equip for just 1 mana, and vehicles you control have crew 1. So it sounds amazing if you read this card, a 4-4, reasonable stance, enters providing a bit of card advantage, and then gives you all these amazing discounts. Now the problem is, this set has very few equipment and vehicles, so Astro for the most part is just going to be a 4 mana 4-4 four, four without any effect, which makes it a lot less exciting of course. So that's going to just give it a C grade overall, as a 4 mana 4-4 four, four is still you know playable. If you happen to have a couple equipment or vehicles, then of course the rating goes up, but in general as a pack 1 pick 1 it's not a very high priority. Next we have Baird and the Argivian Recruiter this time around, a 2 mana 2-2 two -two legendary human soldier at Uncommon, saying at the beginning of your end step, if you control a creature with power greater than its base power, create a 1-1 one -one white soldier creature token. And white soldier creature tokens are going to be kind of the more common type of token in the set. There's a couple soldier payoffs at higher rarity as well. And as we mentioned, Red White cares about being aggressive, cares about going wide, and is also going to have access to a few power and toughness modifiers that can boost up your tokens, either with a few equipment in the set or other bonuses. So that's a way to modify the base power and get a 1 1 token end of turn. So it's not going to be too difficult to enable Baird if you're Red White, especially if you take it early and try and build around it more. So if Baird by himself can keep making 1-1s one every turn, it's an awesome engine for just 2 mana, so it gets a B as well. Belmore Battle Mage Captain, 2 mana, 1-3 a legendary bird wizard in blue-red, has flying, and says whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, all creatures you control get plus 1 plus 0 and gain trample until end of turn. So this is very impactful if you have a few creatures out, especially if they have flying already and can just deal damage directly to the opponent. Trample also helps you get over uh, potential blockers and it ends up very quickly. If you can string together maybe two or even three spells in the same turn, then you can potentially one hit KO the opponent. So Belmore doesn't mess around and a 1-3 flyer for two is also not too bad. So this card is awesome and another early pick and build round card for its respective archetype. Next is Bortuk, Bone Rattle, a 6 mana 4-4 four four legendary troll shaman at Uncommon in black green with our first sighting of Domain, saying when it enters the battlefield, if you cast it, choose target creature card in your graveyard and return that card to the battlefield if its mana value is less than or equal to the number of basic land types among lands you control, otherwise put it into your hand. So either way we're gonna get some value when we play this. Of course at 6 mana it's a little pricey for a 4-4, four four, so we're definitely hoping to get some good value. And let's say we're playing a Bone Rattle deck, we're hoping to at least have 3 basic land types in play by the time we cast it, which I would say is quite attainable. Maybe you, you just are a black-green deck splashing a third color, or you're a, a two-color deck that's splashing black to get access to Bone Rattle. That's probably the most common scenario. 
So we can potentially put a 3-drop in play using the ability, which is not too bad, since then we're getting the mana discount from the 3-drop basically, which adds on to the 4-4, four four, so you get a pretty good deal. So I don't think I'm quite willing to go up to a B, but at the very least a C+. Plus. And this is easily a card you want to splash for if you're a green domain deck, even if you only have a couple black cards, this is certainly deserving to be one of them. Next is Alas Ilkor, Sadistic Pilgrim, 2 mana, 2-2 two -two Legendary, Phyrexian Core Cleric, at Uncommon in black-white, and it has Death Touch. So 2-2 two -two Death Touch for 2, sign me up. But there's more. Whenever another creature enters the battlefield under your control, you gain one life, and whenever another creature you control dies, each opponent loses one life. So this is awesome for a 2-drop. It's impactful when you play it, and it's gonna slowly drain the opponent while gaining you some life. So there's not much more you can ask out of a 2-mana creature, easily gets a B, another great build-around card for the black-white archetype. Then we have Ertai Resurrected, 4-mana, 3-2 Legendary Phyrexian Human Wizard at rare in blue-black, has flash, so we can play it at instant speed, and when it enters the battlefield you can choose up to 1, so you don't have to do anything, but presumably you're gonna wanna choose one of these, either counter, target spell, so a spell that's on the stack, an activated ability or a triggered ability, and then its controller draws a card. So it's not quite as good as just a creature that enters and counters, because the opponent's gonna get to draw a card in return, but you still get the benefit of maybe countering a bomb and replacing it with a random card, or potentially wasting a lot of the opponent's mana while, you know, countering their spell and adding a 3-2 to the board, so it's still a nice exchange. And then we have another option, which is to just destroy another target creature or planeswalker, and its controller draws a card. So we can somewhat compare this to like a ravenous chupacabra in a way, a 2-2 that when it enters destroys a creature. And there's ways in which this is better, there's ways in which this is worse, since of course we're letting the opponent draw a card, and in a game of limited that tends to be quite grindy, that extra card can certainly matter. That being said, this can still deal with a bomb or some big non-creature spell that's on the stack, since we have the advantage of also countering spells. If you have any flicker abilities, not that there's many of those in the set, you can also potentially leverage this ability. And technically you could also destroy your own creature. Uh, let's say you have a random token, you can destroy it to draw a card. So you've got that flexibility as well. So nothing broken here, but just a ton of flexibility, a decent rate, so nothing to complain about, gets a B. And then we have Garna, Bloodfist of Keld, 4 mana, 4-3, four a legendary human berserker at uncommon, in black-red, saying whenever another creature you control dies, draw a card if it was attacking. Otherwise Garna deals 1 damage to each opponent. So as we mentioned earlier in our introduction, Black Red cares about being aggressive, cares about stuff dying, so this is a, a perfect kind of a representation of the archetype. And yeah, if you can keep up the pressure, turn your creature sideways, Garna can provide a ton of value and also just deal some incidental damage. And as a base stat line, 4-3-4-4 four, four, four is not too bad. So another great B-tier level card that you want to try and take early and sort of build around. Next is Ivy, Gleeful Spell Thief, 2 mana, 2-1 two Legendary Fairy Rogue at rare in Simic colors, blue-green, has flying, and says whenever a player casts a spell that targets only a single creature other than Ivy, you may copy that spell, and the copy targets IV. So it takes a second to wrap your head around, but basically what this means is if you have, let's say, a pump spell that you use to target a different creature, then IV is also going to get that benefit to maybe get in some extra damage. But in general, if you actually take a look at the list of cards that uh, pair with IV to enable it, there's not that many. So for the most part, a 2-mana two 2-1 two flyer with a little bit of upside, uh, there's like a 1-mana instant in blue that can shrink a creature down and draw a card, so that can maybe pair with IV as well to just draw 2. So there's definitely a couple cute synergies you can uh, have with IV, but I wouldn't overrate it, so it's not like a bomb level card you want to instantly first pick, but if you're already blue-green, then sure, why not take it and maybe prioritize a pump spell or a fight spell in a, a later pick, but uh, I 
wouldn't go any higher than a C plus for IV. Next is Joyra, Ageless Innovator, 2 mana, 2 3, Legendary Human Artificer at rare, and the Izzet Colors, of course, can tap to put two Ingenuity counters on Joyra, and then you may put an artifact card with mana value X or less from your hand onto the battlefield, where X is the number of Ingenuity counters on Joyra. Now, once again, if you actually take a look at how many artifacts there are in this set, you'll be a little bit disappointed with Joyra, definitely a great card for other formats, but as far as limited goes, mostly just a 2 mana 2-3, two, without a ton of other upside, so C plus for Joyra. Joda the Unifier is a 5 mana mythic rare legendary human wizard, and says legendary creatures you control get plus x plus x, where x is the number of legendary creatures you control, and whenever you cast a legendary spell from your hand, exile cards from the top of your library until you exile a legendary non-land card with lesser mana value, and you may cast that card without paying its mana cost, rest goes on the bottom. So it kind of has legendary cascade in a way. So, okay, Joda is... Uh, you know, difficult to cast, as you can imagine, five colors. That being said, Domain is a potential archetype that could cast Joda, as you want to have access to a ton of different colors and basic land types. So that's one potential deck where you can cast Joda. And uh, to be fair, there are quite a few legendary creatures in the set, a lot more than your normal uh, expansion, just because so many of the uncommons are legendary as well. But I still wouldn't overrate Joda. So if this shows up, pack one, pick one, am I going to take it and try and build around it? Probably yes. Is the deck actually going to end up being good? Probably no. So that should give you an idea of where to rate Joda uh, a C at most, but might even go down to a D. So just, uh, yeah, don't overrate it just because it's a shiny mythic. But uh, yeah, in the right deck, it could certainly be a fun payoff card. King Darien is a 3 mana 2 3 legendary human soldier at rare in green white saying other creatures you control get plus one plus one full stop so already pretty good deal an anthem effect stapled onto a 2 3 creature for three is a great deal and then there's more for five mana we can put a plus one plus one counter on king darian and create a 1 1 white soldier creature token so that's a great mana sink getting both a plus one counter and a token and then we can also sacrifice King Darien at any point to say creatures, or creature tokens rather, we control gain hexproof and indestructible until end of turn. So another nice extra ability on the off chance that the opponent casts a sweeper, I guess, or takes out King Darien, then your tokens can maybe hold off a big attacker for a turn. So just upside stapled onto upside, and uh, overall I think I land on an A for King Darien, certainly a bomb level card and a card you want to take early and will incentivize you to end up in the green-white tokens archetype. Although, again, we've seen that a lot of white decks tend to go white, so you could also maybe end up in a three-color go-white tokens deck and uh, still support King Darien. Next is Lagomus, Hand of Hatred, a three-mana, one-three legendary human shaman at uncommon in black-red saying at the beginning of combat on your turn, create a 2-1 red elemental creature token with Trample and Haste, and we have to sacrifice it at the beginning of the next end step. So we get a token that can get in some damage, we can maybe enable some sacrifice synergies with it, since the token's gonna go away end of turn anyways, we can maybe enable some other death synergies, and we can also tap Lagomos and search our library for a card to put into our hand, but we can only activate this if five or more creatures died this turn. So that's the type of ability you're probably going to forget about because it's almost never going to come up, but then this one time where five creatures and actually do end up dying, you're going to have to make sure to remember to activate it to get full value. But yeah, for the most part we can ignore that last ability, but yeah, just making a 2-1 each turn can be great if you need to enable those uh, attacking synergies like we saw earlier with uh, Garna, for instance, can be a nice way to get some extra cards going as well. So Lagomos seems like another nice build around uncommon and gets a B. Then we have Meria, Scholar of Antiquity, 3 mana, 3-3 three, three legendary elf artificer at rare in red-green, 
saying we can tap an untapped non-token artifact we control to add green mana to our mana pool, or we can tap two untapped non-token artifacts we control to exile the top card of our library, and we may play it this turn. So both of those abilities are awesome. We get a three mana 3-3, three, three, which is pretty decent. Now the problem is, again, if you look at the list of cards in the set, there's not that many artifacts. So, you know, there's not much use in having those abilities if you don't have the artifacts to enable Maria in the first place. So that ends up being kind of a disappointing rare that might be awesome in other formats. can definitely imagine this fitting into some Paradox Engine decks, but uh, as far as limited goes, it's kind of a glorified 3-mana three 3-3. Three, three. So, you know, C plus at most, but that might be generous, might be closer to just a C. Next is Enail, Avizoa, Aeronaut, a 4-mana 2-4 legendary elf scout at Uncommon, has flying, and another signing of Domain, saying when it deals comma damage to a player, look at the top X cards of your library, where X is the number of basic land types among lands you control, and then put up to one of them on top of your library, and the rest on the bottom in a random order, and then if there's five or more basic land types in play, then you get to draw a card. So that's a lot of text to basically say if you hit the opponent, you get a bit of card selection. If you're actually going all in on domain and get all five types, then you get to draw after getting your card selection. So without five basic land types in play, which is probably going to be the most common scenario, this is a little bit disappointing. You know, you're only attacking for two in the air, and then you're not even drawing a card, you're maybe looking at like the top three cards and rearranging them a little bit. Yeah, you would expect more out of a four mana signpost uncommon in uh, Simic Colors. Would rather have a little bit more power instead of four toughness if the plan is to attack anyway, because, you know, if they're promoting you to stay back to make use of that four toughness, then you're not getting the benefit from the ability in the first place. So, you know, it's still a playable card, of course. If you're blue-green, you're always going to play this. But um, I don't think I'm quite going up to B for this one, so it's more like a C+. Then we have Nahal, the Storm Runner, a 5-mana, five 5-4, five legendary, a free to wizard, and uncommon in Is It Colors, and says you may cast sorcery spells as though they had flash, and when it attacks you can pay 2 generic mana, and if you do, when you cast your next instant or sorcery spell this turn, copy it, and you may choose new targets for the copy. Okay, so 5 mana, 5-4, five, not that exciting. Casting sorceries at instant speed, you know, very marginal upside. But we're mostly looking at that last ability. If you attack, pay 2, and then copy the next instant or sorcery spell. So the most likely scenario, you attack with it, pay the 2, hopefully you have a removal spell in hand that you can double up on, and then... Uh, you know, best case scenario, you can actually have your creature survive by removing some blockers, but there's also a decent chance it will die after that one attack, and then, uh, you know, you got your value out of the one attack step, hopefully. But uh, yeah, overall, still seems like a, a decent card, but I wouldn't go wild about it either, so C+. Next we have Nemata, Primeval Warden, 4 mana, 3, 4, Legendary, Tree Folk, at rare in black green, has reach as well, says if a creature an opponent controls would die, exile it instead, and when you do create a 1-1 one, one green sapperling creature token, so an ability reminiscent of Kalitas, but instead of zombie tokens we're getting sapperlings, and then we can also pay a green and sacrifice a sapperling to give it plus 2 plus 2 until end of turn, or we can pay 1 and a black and sacrifice 2 sapperlings to draw a card. So there's not a ton of sapperlings in the set outside of uh, Nemata, so we're mostly going to have to generate the sapperlings from its ability. Hopefully your black-green deck has enough removal to pair with it, and if that's the case, Nemata's going to be awesome, and uh, can maybe go up to an A for uh, Nemata. If your deck doesn't have a ton of uh, removal to enable its ability, then it's going to be a little bit less exciting but uh, we're probably prioritizing removal spells in these colors anyway, so I think this is probably going to be a bomb level card in most scenarios. Next we have Queen Alenal of 
Ruadak, they're not making it easy with the names this time around, a 3 mana star star legendary elf noble at uncommon in green-white. The queen's power and toughness is each equal to the number of creatures you control to begin with, and if one or more creature tokens would be created under your control, those tokens plus a 1-1 white soldier creature token are created instead. So this is awesome in your green-white go-white tokens deck, and making additional soldiers is pretty great, so it doesn't take many extra tokens for this to be an amazing card, and then uh, it's also just going to scale nicely into the late game. So yeah, the queen's pretty great, another B-tier level uncommon that you want to try and take early and build around, and get as many token synergies as you can get your hands on. Next we have Arada, Coalition Warlord, 4 mana, 3-3 three, three legendary elf warrior at uncommon, so got downgraded from uh, previous rare appearances, and, and of course red-green has domain and says whenever Arada becomes tapped, another target creature you control gets plus x plus x until end of turn, where x is the number of basic land types you control. Okay, so there's a little bit to unpack here, and one keyword that we haven't encountered yet that I want to bring up is the enlist mechanic, which we'll see in white, green, and red, and that's an ability that allows you to tap a creature that's untapped, doesn't have summoning sickness, and is not attacking, if you have a creature with enlist that's attacking, and then add that tapped creature's power onto your enlist creature. So what that means is Rada can potentially make use of its ability without having to attack, which, you know, is certainly relevant. If you have a, an enlist creature, you can maybe tap Rada and then get the plus X plus X benefit on top of three extra power from Rada's power, and that's how you maybe get full value out of Rada's ability. Otherwise, it's maybe only going to attack once, and then the opponent gets to block and kill it, and that's basically the end of Rada's story. So Rada does take a little bit of work to get the most out of it. You can maybe back it up with pump spells to keep attacking several times, but that's only going to work for so long. So not the biggest fan of Rada in terms of these uh, uncommons we've seen so far. Probably closer to a C plus than uh, what I would give to some of the other uncommons, which were closer to a B. Next is Wrath, Weatherlight, Stalwart. A 2-mana 1-3 Legendary Human Wizard at Uncommon. And in the Azorius Colors saying, Whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, you may tap two untapped creatures you control if you do draw a card. Okay, so we can tap Raph himself alongside another random token maybe. So not too difficult to enable. And uh, cards can quickly add up. This seems like a relatively grindy format from the looks of it. So, yeah, card advantage is going to be important. But then there's more. For 5 mana, creatures you control get plus 1 plus 1 and gain vigilance until end of turn. Wow. So we get an extra finishing ability as well. Once we make a couple tokens, leverage that extra card advantage, we also get a way to actually finish off our opponent. So Raf kind of does it all, and I'm quite impressed by it. And this might be one of the few uncommons that I want to bump up all the way to an A, just because of how cheap Raph is to get down, pretty easy to get a few extra cards out of him, and then late game it's also a finisher, so again, what more can you ask out of a 2-drop? This seems awesome. Next is Rata Drabic of Urborg, 4 mana, 3-3 three, three legendary zombie wizard at rare in black-white, has vigilance and ward 2, so if the opponent wants to target or a creature with removal or an ability, they're going to have to pay 2 mana, otherwise it's going to get countered. And says other zombies you control have vigilance. Okay, there's not too many other zombies, but as we'll read here, there's ways to make zombies, because whenever another legendary creature you control dies, create a token that's a copy of that creature, except it's not legendary, and it's a 2-2 black zombie in addition to its other colors and types. And as we mentioned earlier, there's a lot of legendaries in the set. We've seicn a lot of them so far in the uh, multicolor section. So yeah, it's gonna be pretty easy to find a few legendaries to pair with Rata Drabic. That being said, a 3-3 Vigilance Ward 2, if you don't have anything else to go with it, it's, you know, kind of underwhelming. 
So it does take a little bit of work to get the full value out of it. Can maybe pair it with sacrifice effects. So if the opponent doesn't cooperate, you still have a way of maybe sacrificing your own creatures and getting those zombies going. So those are the synergies you want to look for, but that's mostly what Black White is interested in doing anyway. So yeah, card seems okay, but I also wouldn't go wild about it either. So probably land somewhere in a C plus. Next is Rith, a liberated primeval, five mana, five five, a legendary dragon at mythic, and in the Naya colors, so white, green, and red, says it has flying and ward two once again, and other dragons you control also have ward two. Not too many other dragons in this set, I can tell you. And at the beginning of your end step, if a creature or planeswalker an opponent controls was dealt excess damage this turn. You get to make a 4-4 red dragon creature token with flying. So excess damage we can easily attain with maybe a red burn spell dealing more damage than the creature's toughness. It's going to be unlikely for the opponent to want to block Rith and uh, you know get excess damage dealt that way. So it's mostly red burn spells. Maybe there's a couple white removal spells that deal damage as well that you could pair with uh, Rith to make extra dragons. But the fail case here is still a 5 mana 5 5 flyer with ward 2, so it has a bit of built in protection. The opponent's unlikely to be able to answer it for less mana than you paid for it. So this still feels like a bomb level card for sure, and gets an A. Next we have Rivas of the Claw, 3 mana 3 3 legendary Vyoshino Warlock at rare, in black red has menace, so 3 3 menace for 3, not too bad can also tap it to add 2 mana in any combination of colors, but we can only spend it to cast dragon creature spells. I just mentioned that there's not too many dragons in this set, and you're not gonna be lucky enough to open Rith alongside it very often, so that means that this mana ability is not gonna be all that relevant. And then once during each of your turns you may cast a dragon creature spell from your graveyard, and then it enters with the text saying when it dies, exile it instead of putting it back in your graveyard. So Rivas, I'm sure it's going to be pretty awesome to build around in uh, various formats, all the way from standard to brawl and commander. As far as limited goes, it's mostly just a 3 mana 3 3 with menace, which is fine, but you know, it's not a card you're crazy wild about first picking and building around. So C plus for Rivas. Next is Rona, Shieldred's Faithful, 4 mana, 3 4, Legendary Human Wizard at Uncommon in blue black. Says whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, each opponent loses one life. So just passively drains the opponent in a color combination that has a high density of instants and sorceries. And you can also cast Rona from your graveyard by discarding two cards in addition to paying its other costs. That's pretty awesome, because Having a recursive uh, threat means you can always count on Rona to come back. In the late game, maybe you have a few extra lands in hand you don't need, discard those and get Rona back. And a 3-4, especially in blue-black, is pretty big in terms of power and toughness. Can do a good job of protecting your life total. And, you know, if you're playing Rona, you're probably happy to just keep the status quo and slowly drain the opponent while you pull ahead with your blue card draw and uh, control the game with your black removal spells. So that's where you want to kind of play Rona. And in that deck, she seems pretty awesome. So I'll give her a B. Another one of those powerful multicolor build arounds. Next is Rulik Mons, a Warren Chief, 4 mana, 3-3 three, three legendary goblin, at uncommon in red-green, has menace. And when Rulik Mons attacks, look at the top card of your library, if it's a land card, you may put it onto the battlefield tapped. If you didn't put a card onto the battlefield this way, create a 1-1 red goblin creature token instead. So Rulik Mons requires a bit of work to get going. 4 mana 3-3 three, three menace is a little bit overpriced since we've seen quite a few 3-3 three, three menace for 3 so far. You know, menace helps with maybe attacking unopposed, but if the opponent sees you play Rulik Mons, they're going to be prepared and keep plenty of blockers back, so it's maybe only going to get to attack once, and if that's the case, you're not going to get a whole lot of benefit out of it. And even if you do manage to attack, you know, an extra land or an extra 1-1 is not necessarily going to make a huge difference on the game, so 
overall a fine card if you compare it with maybe some pump spells or removal to clear a path. Otherwise it's kind of an unexciting uncommon. So I think this might go as low as a C for me. Just doesn't quite cut it compared to some of the other uncommons. Then we have Shana, Purifying Blade, a 3 mana, 3-3 three, three legendary human warrior at Mythic in the band colors. So it's going to be tricky to cast this on turn 3, but if you can, it's going to be pretty awesome as a 3-3 three, three with lifelink, saying at the beginning of your end step you may pay X. If you do, draw X cards, but X cannot be greater than the amount of life you gained this turn. So if I manage to hit with Shana, gain 3, then I can spend 3 to draw 3 end of turn. So that's a pretty great deal. Of course the trouble is getting to connect with your life linker is going to be difficult, so you probably need another source of life gain to leverage Shana. There's a couple lifelink creatures in the set, not too many. There's a couple cards that gain life when entering the battlefield, so those are probably the easiest way to leverage Shana. But then the trouble is also casting those cards that gain life and still having the mana to sink into Shana's ability. So it's a tricky card. There's also a couple like fight spells that uh, you can maybe pair with your lifelinking Shana to deal damage in the form of lifelink damage, and then you can maybe trigger its ability. So I think the green fight spells are probably the easiest way to leverage this uh, ability. Otherwise it's going to be a little tricky, but just keep your eyes open for any potential life gain synergies. And uh, yeah, Shana seems worth taking, you know, relatively early if you get the chance. Because if you can, you know, get a few hits in, then uh, it's going to quickly take over the game. But I don't think it quite pushes up to a bomb level card just because of how tricky it is to get in play and actually benefit from the ability. So I would probably end up somewhere near a B for Shanna. Then we have Solkanar the Tainted. 5 mana, 5-5, five, five, a legendary elemental demon at Mythic. And this is a very tricky one to evaluate. So this is in the Grixis colors, blue, black, and red. It says at the beginning of your end step, choose one mode that hasn't been chosen yet. Something we've seen before on cards like Demonic Pact. And you'll see in a second why I mentioned Demonic Pact specifically. So first option, draw a card. We can make each opponent lose two life and we gain two life. Or we can deal three damage to up to one other target creature or planeswalker. So those all seem amazing. And then you get to the last mode, which says Exile Solkanar, and then return it to the battlefield under an opponent's control. Okay, so how do we break this card, quote-unquote? Maybe there's some flicker effects, but if you look at the set, there's actually not that many. So that's probably not going to work. But, you know, this is kind of thinking with your constructed brain, like how do we break this card, how do we flicker it so we never give it to the opponent? But then you put on your kind of limited thinking cap and you look at this card and it's a 5 mana 5-5 five five with three awesome abilities. So how many turns can the opponents just, you know, sit there and take 5 damage of Solkanar, assuming you're attacking with it, before they either have to, you know, kill it or, you know, block and trade for it? So it's a very tricky card to evaluate once again, but if you get this down... It's either going to win you the game, or it's going to maybe trade and still provide a ton of value, or the worst case scenario, it sits there not actually trading or eating a removal spell, and the opponent eventually gains control of it, and then you're in trouble. Although you were probably in trouble anyways, so I don't know if this necessarily lost you the game, or if you were kind of losing anyway. But I think this card's actually totally fine, and uh, at the very least should get a C+. So that's kind of where I land on Solkanar. Next we have Soul of Windgrace, 4 mana, 5-4 legendary cat avatar at Mythic in Junt Colors, and when it enters a battlefield or attacks, you may put a land card from a graveyard onto the battlefield tapped under your control. Okay, so 5-4 um, can get lands back from the graveyard, that sounds pretty cool. But there's more. We can pay a green, discard a land card to gain 3 life. We can pay 1 and a red, discard a land card to draw a card. Okay, got me interested there. And can pay 2 and a black, discard a land card, gains indestructible until end of turn, and we tap it. 
So that's an easy way to keep attacking with Soul of Wind Grace. Even if the opponent has some good blockers, you just make it indestructible and still get maybe the value of getting a lance back from the graveyard. So this card seems awesome. Uh, ideally, you can get immediate value by having a land in the graveyard when you play it. And correct me if I'm wrong, but because it doesn't target a land when it enters or attacks, it just says you may put a land card from a graveyard onto the battlefield tapped. I think if you, let's say, have five mana, you can play Soul of Wind Grace and with a trigger on the stack, pay a green, discard land, gain three, and then still get that very same land back from uh, the graveyard. So that's maybe the best way to get immediate value out of Soul of Wind Grace if you can afford it. So, you know, just some side notes to maybe think about. And you can indeed also get lands from the opponent's graveyard should that come up. And uh, yeah, I think this might even get up to the A tier bomb level card. Just make sure you keep lands in hand instead of playing them out, get your value and then get them back into play. And Soul of Wind Grace will do the rest. Then we have Sten, Paranoid, Partisan, 2 mana, 2-2, two, two, Legendary Human Wizard, at rare in blue-white. And when it enters the battlefield, choose a card type other than a creature or land. So presumably it's going to be like artifacts, instant, sorcery, maybe enchantment. And then spells you cast of the chosen type cost 1 less to cast. So getting a nice discount. And then for one, a white and a blue, exile Sten, and then return it to the battlefield under its owner's control at the beginning of the next end step. So you can maybe save it from a removal spell, although I think the coolest interaction maybe is like chum blocking with it and then exiling it. That way we can soak up some damage. Yeah, there's quite a few tricky things you can do with Sten, and then when it enters the battlefield again, you can maybe switch the card type to get a discount somewhere else if the cards in hand changed over time. So pretty great for a 2-drop, as it has a ton of extra upside. So is this a C plus or a B is the question, and uh, I think probably still closer to a C plus than a B. Since we cannot discount creatures, there's only so many instants and sorceries you're going to have in your decks to get a discount from. So, you know, it's still pretty minimal. And keeping up three mana to do the exile trick is only going to be relevant once you're later in the game, at which point a 2-2 is not that impactful. But overall, still definitely a card I'm happy to take relatively early. And if I'm blue-white, I'm never going to cut it from my deck. Next is Tatiova, Steward of Tides. 3 mana, 3-3 three, three legendary Merfolk Druid at Uncommon in blue-green. Land creatures you control have flying. Okay. And then whenever land enters battlefield under your control, if you control 7 or more lands, up to one target land becomes a 3-3 three, three elemental creature with haste, and it's still a land. So Tatiova doesn't really do anything until you get to that 7 land threshold. At which point Tatiova will kill the opponent very quickly, especially if you have some additional ramp cards to put lands in play. Double green and blue means it's not going to be trivial to cast it on curve. I'm not loving Tatiova, but it's certainly still a powerful addition to any blue-green deck, which presumably has access to a bit of acceleration to get additional lands in play to speed up the process. So means a C plus for Tatiova overall. Next we have Tori Davenant, Fury Rider, 4 mana, 3-3 three, three legendary human knight in the Boros Colors, red-white and uncommon, has Vigilance and Trample, and whenever Tori attacks, all other attacking creatures you control get plus one plus one until end of turn, and other red attacking creatures you control get Trample until end of turn, untap each other white attacking creature you control. I guess I couldn't give those Vigilance since it's already too late at that point. But yeah, Pseudo Vigilance, I guess, to white, whereas red gets Trample. So it kind of mirrors Tori's own abilities. Yeah, in a red-white aggro deck, you're going to be making some tokens, hopefully, and then uh, pumping those up. But just any creature curve that goes 2-drop, 3-drop into Tori, maybe backed up by a removal spell or a pump spell, is going to be quite devastating for the opponent. But it's also just a 3-3 for 4 at the end of the day, so it's not the most difficult creature to eventually block and take out. So you do really need to be able to back it up with something else to make sure you can keep attacking with it reliably. I think C plus for Tori, because it's maybe a little bit 
understand it by itself, doesn't have haste, so it doesn't have an immediate impact on the battlefield, but if you can untap with it, it should be quite powerful. Tura, Kenarid, Sky Knight, 5 mana, 3-3, three, three, legendary, human and knight, and uncommon in blue-white, has flying, and says whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, create a 1-1 one, one white soldier creature token. Yeah, this card's great. Blue-white's gonna have quite a few instants and sorceries to begin with, and uh, this is a threat that can close out the game while either building up a bigger army or giving you 1-1 one, one chum blockers on the ground to buy time and maybe win a, a racing situation. So this card's great and gets a B. Then we have Org, Spawn of Turg, a 3 mana, star, 5, legendary frog beast, and uncommon in black green, and its power is equal to the number of land cards in your graveyard. So if you play it on turn 3 or 4, it's probably not going to have any power to begin with, but you know, still 5 toughness to maybe soak up some damage. And then at the beginning of your upkeep, look at the top card of your library, and you may put that card into your graveyard. So especially once you get to the mid to late game, you're going to be pretty happy to put lands in the graveyard, since you don't want to draw them, and then you're also passively growing org. And then you can also pay a black and a green to sacrifice a land and gain two life, so you can maybe use that as sort of a combat trick to grow org's power, and then uh, the opponent will have to respect that whenever attacking into it, or trying to block it, of course. So it has a nice bit of threat of activation, as we call it. So this card seems okay. Um, gives you that card selection also, just from uh, the upkeep trigger, potentially getting rid of cards you don't need, even if they are necessarily lands. I wouldn't expect this to have a ton of power to start out, unless you have other cards that mill, and there are quite a few in black green. This can also help enable some graveyard synergies that just uh, require you to have creatures in the graveyard to get back. So this is more of an enabler, I would say, than a payoff in and of itself, just because I don't expect it to have a ton of power, but especially in the late game, it's going to be a real threat. And uh, yeah, all that for just three mana, even though it's going to be tricky to cast on curve, still seems relatively powerful. So C plus at the very least, but uh, could see this performing quite well and getting up to the B range over time. Then we have Vohar, Vodalion, Desecrator, 2 mana, 1 2 legendary Phyrexian, Merfolk Wizard, and Uncommon in blue black. Can tap it to draw a card and then discard a card. And if we discarded an instant or sorcery card, each opponent loses one life and we gain one life. So it's kind of an improved Merfolk Looter, even though. We need two colors to cast it, and then we can also pay two mana and sacrifice it to cast target instant or sorcery from our graveyard this turn, and then exile it afterwards. So maybe in the late game we can get back a removal spell to make sure the opponent's threats don't get out of hand. And in the meantime, this is improving our hand. I doubt we're going to drain the opponent much, since we typically want to keep instants and sorceries in hand and discard lands, for instance or uh, creatures that aren't very impactful in the late game. Now, of course, if we sacrifice it, we also have to pay two mana, so we wouldn't be able to cast a very expensive uh, spell alongside it, especially given that if we're looting with it, we're probably discarding lands, so we're not going to have too much mana in play to use the ability and then cast an expensive spell out of the graveyard, so it's mostly going to try and get back something on the cheaper end of the spectrum, which is uh, important to keep in mind. But yeah, still a nice looting effect and a little bit of extra upside stapled on top. So pretty good for a 2-drop. Does it quite get to the B range is the question. I think it's probably still closer to C+, but uh, if I'm blue-black I'm very happy to have this on turn 2. Scion of Ephrava, 5 mana, 4-4 four, four, legendary cat warrior and uncommon in green-white. And green-white, as we saw earlier, cares about going wide and has a small domain theme as well. And this encapsulates that beautifully. It says, whenever the scion becomes tapped, put a plus one plus one counter on each creature you control with toughness less than the number of basic land types among lands you control. So let's assume we have three basic land types in play when we play the scion. Then uh, 
let's say this becomes tapped, then creatures with toughness 2 or less would get a plus 1 plus 1 counter in that scenario. Most of the tokens are going to be 1-1s one anyway, so those you can enable even if you just have two basic land types, but hopefully you've got a few more. But the main synergy here, once again, I mentioned it when talking about Rada, is with Enlist, because if this attacks, you can maybe get one trigger out of it, the opponent's going to do their best to block and kill it, but if you have an Enlist creature, you can maybe tap this and uh, tap it several times without putting it in harm's way. So that's what you're going to be looking for to pair with the Scion of Evrava, is as many Enlist creatures as possible. And uh, then I can see this doing a, a lot of work. So overall, I think a B for Scion of Evrava. Then we have Azur, Eternal, Schemer, 3 mana, 1 for Legendary Human Wizard at Mythic in Esper Colors has Flying, and says Enchantment, creatures you control have Death Touch, Lifelink, and Hexproof. Okay, and for 1 and a white, target non-aura enchantment you control becomes a creature in addition to its other types and has base power and toughness, each equal to its mana value. There are a few enchantments in the set, not too many, but there's quite a few sagas, as we'll see. I think white probably has the highest density of enchantments overall. So how do we evaluate Xur? 3 mana 1 for flyer is okay, maybe a little tricky to cast on curve, so not the best rate in that regard. But if we have a 3 or 4 mana enchantment sitting around, then we can uh, potentially enable it and turn it into a creature. And then it has quite a few relevant keywords. Death Touch, Lifelink, so that's going to add up pretty quickly. And also relevant to note, it's not until end of turn, it's just, just going to stay a creature. I guess Sagas will eventually go away, fun build around, and if you take this, then uh, be on the lookout for as many enchantments as possible, and then this can easily take over the game. So we'll go with C plus for Xur. So next up, we'll take a look at the white cards. First white card, Anointed Peacekeeper, 3 mana, 3-3. Three, three. Creature, human cleric at rare with vigilance, and when it enters the battlefield, look at an opponent's hand and choose any card name. Doesn't have to be a card in the opponent's hand, by the way. And then spells your opponent's cast with a chosen name cost two generic more to cast, and activated abilities of sources with a chosen name also cost two more to activate, unless they're mana abilities. So this can choose something that's on the battlefield that might have an activated ability, can choose a card you've maybe seen in a previous game if you're playing best of three. So there's additional flexibility. If the opponent's empty-handed, you can still name something that the opponent may or may not have in their deck to make it more expensive. A little bit different from Elite Spellbinder, but of course has a very similar vibe. This uh, 3 3 Vigilance, which typically worse than a 3 1 Flyer, but uh, still a pretty decent card, and at the very least a B for Limited. Then we have Archangel of Wrath, a 4 mana, 3 4 Angel at rare, and I believe this is our first sighting of Kicker. Can pay a black and or a red in addition to the 4 mana to kick the Archangel, and it's a 3 4 Flying Lifelink, which is already pretty decent to start out. But if we paid the Kicker, when it enters the battlefield, if it was kicked, it deals 2 damage to any target. So 2 damage from a life-linking creature means we also gain two life, and if we kicked it twice, it deals another two damage to any targets, so we can spread out four damage if we cast this for six mana total. So this card's awesome. If we can cast it for all three colors at six mana, a three-four flying lifelink that gains four and deals four damage is gonna easily swing the game back in your favor, and even if the opponent answers it, hopefully you'll still have gotten a great benefit out of it. So this definitely fits the definition of a bomb level card. Even if you can only kick it once, it's still quite great. But uh, hopefully you can find a way to support both black and red on the splash. And then we have our first siding of the enlist mechanic, which I've already briefly talked about a few times. 
are given Cavalier, 3 mana, 2-2, two, two, Orc, Knight at common, has Enlist, meaning as this creature attacks, you may tap a non-attacking creature you control without summoning sickness, and then if you do, add that creature's power to this creature until end of turn. Conveniently, we get a 1-1 token when this enters, so that can illustrate the ability even more. So let's say we play Cavalier. On the following turn, the 1-1 token no longer has summoning sickness. Cavalier attacks as a 2-2. We use the Enlist ability, tapping or 1-1, which isn't attacking in this scenario. And now Cavalier is a 3-2. So that's how Enlist works. Can only enlist one creature, from what I can tell. And uh, yeah, that's potentially also a way to enable tap abilities like we've seen on uh, Rada and on the uh, five mana Scion of Ephrava in uh, the previous section. So definitely a few synergies to watch out for, but it's a nice way to enable some creatures to attack that otherwise wouldn't be able to, or still get benefit from, in this case, let's say a 1-1 one -one token, if the opponent has a 2-2 blocker, the 1-1 would be useless otherwise. Now we can maybe add one point of power to the Cavalier to force a trade, still have our 1-1 token left over. And uh, especially if you have Enlist stapled onto an evasive creature, something that might have, like, say, Flying or Trample, it becomes much better as you're more likely to connect with your creature and be able to attack several times. Cavalier is probably just gonna force a trade for the opponent's and then you still have the benefit of a 1-1 token left over, which is still quite nice. So if we have to grade Cavalier by itself, it's, I think, a C+. plus. seems like a great common that enables a lot of the archetypes in white that care about going wide and having a few disposable tokens to maybe sacrifice. But uh, yeah, just a nice point to kind of talk about Enlist in general as a mechanic. Next is the Argivian Phalanx, a 6-mana 4-4 human core soldier at common. And as we'll see, this is a cycle of common creatures in each color that get a 1-mana discount if certain conditions are met. In this case, we get a 1-mana discount for each creature we control and a 4-4 Vigilance. So let's say your average scenario, you played a 2-drop and you played a 3-drop. You have two creatures in play. This will cost 4 mana, we can play a 4 mana 4-4 four, four Vigilance. That seems like a good deal. Sometimes you'll get even more tokens going, and you'll be able to play this for 2 or 3 mana, which is great, but at the end of the day, I think viewing this as kind of a 4 mana 4-4 four, four Vigilance is probably a healthy way to go about it, and in that case, this seems like a totally fine card. I uh, think still probably closer to a C than a C+. Plus. But in some decks that are super heavy on the token theme, I could see this going up in value the cheaper you can cast it. But in your average white deck, C seems appropriate. Artillery Blast, 2 mana, instant at common with Domain. And there's not too many uh, white cards with Domain, this is one of them. Blast deals X damage to target tapped creature, where X is 1, plus the number of basic land types among lands you control. We've seen effects like this in the past. Often it's like 2 mana deal 4 damage to a an attacking or blocking creature, or sometimes a tapped creature. In order for this to deal 4 damage, we would need to have 3 basic land types, as it's 3 plus 1 is 4. In a two-color deck, this is kind of underwhelming. Also gets much better the more controlling your deck is, as you're more likely to face tapped creatures that you need to get out of the way. Um, whereas an aggro deck needs to get rid of untapped creatures for the most part, and then Blast is not going to help. So, not a huge fan of Blast. I think it's going to be okay in kind of the three, four-color domain decks that tend to be kind of slower, more controlling will have an easier time getting those basic land types going. But in your average go white deck, which whites seems to promote pretty heavily in several combinations, blast seems pretty weak. So I'm going to give this a D. Banalish Faith Bonder, 2 mana, 1, 3, Human Cleric at common, with Vigilance and Enlist. So pretty simple creature, but I think it'll play out pretty 
nicely as a creature with vigilance and enlist. You know, if the opponent takes it, then we still have a 1-3 vigilance back to help double block or triple block. Also worth mentioning, I suppose, is a 1-3 on defense might be slightly weaker in this set than usual. Uh, can kind of illustrate that with the previous enlist creature we've seen, a 2-2, two -two, and uh, that makes a 1-1 one -one token with enlist, as it'll be able to attack as a 3-2. So now all of a sudden a 1-3 doesn't block the 2-2 two -two that the opponent had originally. So blocking gets a little bit worse when enlist is in the set, especially if the creature that's blocking doesn't have a ton of power. So, you know, just high toughness might not be enough to hold off uh, attacks from certain decks. So, you know, just a small side note here. But the Faith Bonder seems like a fine playable card. We'll give it a C. Banalish Sleeper, 2 mana, 3 1 Phyrexian Human Soldier. And it has Kicker for a single black. And when it enters, if it was kicked, each player sacrifices a creature. So slots in perfectly in the black white kind of token sacrifice decks. And hopefully you'll be able to sacrifice a random 1-1 one -one token to the ability, whereas the opponent may have something bigger and more valuable in play. But then we still have the flexibility of playing this as a 3-1, which is probably not going to attack very well if the set has a lot of 1-1 one -one tokens running around. But it can block some larger creatures potentially. So yeah, overall Sleeper seems like a C plus if you're in black-white. Otherwise, probably not going to be super interested. Captain's Call, a 4-mana sorcery, creating 3 1-1 one, one white soldier creature tokens. So this is kind of the ultimate card to ask yourself the question, like, is my deck a go-white deck? Do I care about making lots of small bodies? If the answer is no, then you're probably not going to want Captain's Call. If you have some payoff cards for making lots of tokens or controlling several creatures, whether it's to attack with them and pump them, or to maybe sacrifice them in your black-white decks, then a Captain's Call could slot in nicely. So overall we'll give this a C grade, but you'll just have to grade it accordingly to what your deck's game plan is. But again, I wouldn't prioritize this. I would try and take the token payoff cards before taking too many Captain's Calls, but once I have like one or two nice payoffs, then sure, we'll start uh, taking the Captain's Call a little bit higher. Next is Charismatic Vanguard, 3 mana, 3-2 three, Dwarf Soldier at common, and has a nice activated ability for 5 mana, creatures you control get plus 1 plus 1 until end of turn. So this seems like a great 3-drop, it's a fine play on curve, has relatively decent power and toughness, but then also gives you a late game mana sink, especially in a tokens deck. So whenever your creature that's good early also has a relevant late game ability, it goes up in value dramatically. So C plus for Vanguard. Citizen's Arrest is going to be the white removal spell uh, at common that you'll see a lot. An enchantment for one and double white, so not the easiest to cast on curve. When it enters the battlefield, exile target creature or planeswalker an opponent controls until Arrest leaves the battlefield. We've definitely seen a lot of these effects in the past before. And uh, I think over time these effects have gotten a little bit worse uh, between more potential main deck disenchant effects, more ways to potentially sacrifice creatures. Now, this is a little bit different from your usual pacifism in that it actually exiles the creature, so it doesn't keep it in play for the opponent to maybe sacrifice or flicker. But uh, that being said, Arrest still feels kind of like a clunky removal spell and probably doesn't get into the premium B tier of common removal spells, but rather in the C plus range. Cleaving Skyrider, 3 mana, 2-2 two -two human warrior at uncommon with flash, and also has flying, so 2-2 two -two flash flying for 3 is, you know, fine, but probably still pretty average. But it also has Kicker for 2 and a red, and when it enters the battlefield, if it was kicked, it deals X damage to any target where X is the number of attacking creatures. Okay, so this slots in nicely in your red-white aggro decks. Can flash this in 
after declaring attackers but before blockers. So you can maybe take out a large blocker from the opponent. Let's say you're attacking with, you know, in this example, three random tokens and a and that's it. Then you can flash this in and deal three damage. So that can probably take out something relevant. Let's say the opponent has a four toughness creature. Then now you maybe wait until after blockers to finish off the 4-4 and deal 3 damage to it. So there's a lot of ways to play Skyrider. And uh, you can also flash this in in the opponent's turn technically, because it doesn't care about the creatures attacking being creatures you control, it's just creatures in general. So it can also play defensively. So a very flexible card, although assuming you're red-white, it's probably going to be used on offense more than on defense. So flexible, although if you want to get the kicker, it's 6 mana, which is quite pricey. But we still have the flexibility of playing it for 3. So yeah, I like the Skyrider quite a bit. We'll give it a C plus at the very least. And can indeed also target the opponent directly if you need to close out the game with it. Clockwork, a drawbridge, a 1 mana, 03 artifact creature wall at common, has defender. And for 2 and a white, we can tap it to tap target creature. 03, not that exciting on defense in a format that's filled with go white decks where this doesn't discourage any attacks, and especially also in a format with enlist where now all of a sudden the opponent's small creatures can attack past it. And then to tap an opposing creature, it's 3 mana, which is very expensive for this type of effect, which we prefer to have for like maybe 1 mana or, you know, best case scenario for free. So a drawbridge doesn't quite cut it there. Uh, now I will note there is a small defender sub-theme in this set, a couple cards that care about controlling multiple defenders that get better the more you have. So that's kind of the corner case where you might consider drawbridge. Otherwise I'm not really interested and I'll give it a D. Next we have Coalition Sky Knight which is a 4 mana 2-2 two, two human knight at uncommon, has flying and enlist. And this is what I mentioned earlier when talking about enlist. If you can pair it with an evasive creature, it just gets so much better, as you can now attack potentially unopposed, sink all your extra um, power that may not be able to attack into it, and deal a nice chunk of damage. Maybe you've got like a random 3-1 that can't attack because of the opponent's 1-1 one, one blockers. Now we can attack for 5 all of a sudden, and uh, the Sky Knight's likely to be able to attack several times. So this is a very scary card that can quickly uh, close out the game. And uh, yeah, I think I'm willing to give it a B. Damitha Benalia's Hope, 5 mana, 4-4 four, four legendary human knight at rare, has first strike, vigilance, and lifelink. So if we just stop reading the card there, 5 mana, 4-4, four, four, First Strike, Vigilance, Lifelink, that's a lot of stats and very tricky for the opponent to race or you know attack into, especially if you can back it up with any sort of combo trick. But there's more, when Danitha enters the battlefield, you may put an aura or equipment card from your hand or graveyard onto the battlefield attached to Danitha. Well, I have good news and bad news. The... Good news is if you're facing Danitha, you're unlikely to also face an aura or equipment. Uh, the bad news is if you're playing with Danitha, you're unlikely to have an aura or equipment to get back since there just aren't very many in this set. There's maybe like two or three auras and two or three equipment. So for the most part, Danitha, five mana, four, four, first strike, vigilance, lifelink, even if we just uh, call it a day at that point, it's still an amazing card. So, falls somewhere in between a B and an A. But uh, again, this is easily bomb territory if you can back it up with a pump spell. Um, I guess the uh, one downside is that it doesn't necessarily have an immediate impact on the battlefield if the opponent can remove it. So, a very high B tier, kind of a low A. Destroy Evil is next. Two mana for an instant. At common lets us choose one between destroying a creature with toughness 4 or greater, or we can destroy target enchantment. There are a few enchantments in the set, some white removal spells as we've seen, there's a couple sagas, but it's definitely not an enchantment focused set, so I wouldn't main deck enchantment removal, but of course destroy evil has a second mode of 
destroying a creature with toughness 4 or greater, which I would argue is the primary mode of destroy evil. And there will be decks that just don't have any 4 toughness creatures, thinking of all the go wide token decks. Uh, those are un unlikely to have a ton of 4 toughness creatures, whereas they'll easily have some 4 powered creatures, especially once you factor in and list. So Destroy Evil is kind of hit or miss. It can be a very efficient and nice removal spell. I would probably never play more than one copy in my main deck, but uh, once you consider sideboarding, then of course you can uh, board it in accordingly. It's going to be awesome against green decks, for instance. But um, kind of in the dark, if you don't know what you're playing against, I would at most main deck one. And if you have better removal spells that aren't as conditional, you can maybe even leave it out of the deck. So this is kind of a low C, high D. I would be happy to play one, but I would be hesitant to play more than one in the main deck starting out. Next is Defiler of Faith, and this is a cycle of rare Phyrexian cards. Uh, this is a 5 mana 5-5 five five with Vigilance saying as an additional cost to cast white permanent spells you may pay 2 life and those spells cost a white mana less to cast if you paid life this way and the effect only reduces the amount of white mana you pay. And yeah, this is an entire cycle of these rares that give you a discount being able to use life instead of paying extra mana. And there's more. Whenever you cast a white permanent spell, create a 1-1 white soldier creature token. So that includes creatures you cast, as well as maybe enchantments. And there's a few of those in whites that can act as removal. So the Defiler does not mess around, will quickly create an army of 1-1 tokens, help you get on the board quickly, and then you can maybe close out the game with some random pump spell or anthem effect. So all the Defilers are awesome. The white one is no exception and gets an A. Griffin Protector, 4 mana, 2 3 flyer, a reprint from a core set, I believe, saying whenever another creature enters the battlefield under your control, the Griffin gets plus 1 plus 1 until end of turn. So plays very nicely in your token decks that will make several tokens to pump Protector and get in a lot of damage. So this card seems quite nice, and uh, most of the white decks are go-white decks after all, so this should be able to slot into most white decks without too much trouble, so easily a C+. Guardian of New Banalia, 2 mana, 2-2 two, two human soldier at a rare, with Enlist, and when the Guardian enlists a creature, Scry 2 can also discard a card to give it indestructible until end of turn and tap it. So definitely an ability we've seen before on uh, white 2-drops. So nice way to protect it. And uh, yeah, the enlist here paired with the indestructible means you can pretty much attack into any board without too much trouble. And then the scry 2 also quickly adds up, giving you that card selection, getting rid of lands you don't need, finding more action. So. If you're facing a Guardian of New Banalia, your best bet is probably just to try and race it, because blocking is going to be tricky. There's a few ways to get around Indestructible. There's cards at Exile, there's a black removal spell giving minus two, minus two. So there are definitely answers to a Guardian, but uh, it's still not a card I wish to face, especially not on turn two. So this card seems quite strong, we'll give it a B. Heroic Charge, 4 mana, instant, at common, giving creatures you control plus 2 plus 1 until end of turn. But it also has Kicker for 1 and a red, in which case if those creatures gain Trample as well. So it's an upgraded Inspired Charge, which is the same without the Kicker ability. And Inspired Charge can be a very devastating finisher in a tokens deck. And from the looks of it, white is going to be filled with go white creature decks. So an Inspired Charge is exactly what you're looking for to close out the game. So having two, maybe up to three copies of Heroic Charge if your deck is a fully dedicated token aggro deck seems uh, quite nice. And then the Kicker is just a cherry on top. It's not always going to be relevant, uh, but uh, you know, why not? So don't be afraid to play Heroic Charge in your green-white tokens deck, for instance. Just because this has a red Kicker ability, it's still very good without it. So 
How do we rate heroic charge? It's somewhere between a C and a C plus. I could see this ending up in the C plus category and being a highly fought over card that all the white decks want access to. Could also end up being a card that goes pretty late and people prioritize the token makers over the kind of pump spells. So I'm going to start out with a more conservative uh, C for heroic charge, but definitely a card you'll have to keep in mind if the opponent's attacking with all their small creatures and has four mana available. And uh, if they have red mana and six total, then uh, be aware that trample might be in your future as well. Join forces, a three mana pump spell at instant speed here at uncommon, saying untap up to two target creatures and they each get plus two plus two until end of turn. Very powerful pump spell, um, a little bit smaller in scope than the heroic charge we just covered, but a bit more efficient at three mana. And uh, since it's an uncommon, people are not gonna face it as much and it's gonna make it trickier to play around to an extent. I think this might bump up to a C+, but yeah, it's definitely uncommon for a reason. Not a card you want to give to every white deck, otherwise it's going to be a nightmare to block. Then we have the Juniper Order Rootweaver, 2 mana, 2-2, two, two, Human Druid at common, and also as kicker for single green, in which case it can put a plus one plus one counter on target creature you control when it enters including on itself, so it could be a 3-mana three 3-3, three, three, which is not exciting, but, you know, it's still a nice extra ability stapled onto a 2-mana two 2-2, two two, so you get a nice bit of flexibility. Outside of a green deck, this is pretty underwhelming. In a green-white deck, I'm pretty happy to have Rootweaver, but it's still probably just a C. I don't think it gets to the C-plus tier. Knight of Dawn's Light, 2 mana, 2-2 two, two Human Knight at Uncommon, has First Strike, saying if you would gain life, you gain that much life plus 1 instead. And for 1 and a white, it gets plus 1 plus 1 until end of turn. So we can pump it several times if we'd like. Great mana sync and pumping power just pairs very naturally with First Strike, making it a nightmare for the opponent to block. The life gain mode, you know, is just random upside, I wouldn't pay too much attention to it but can maybe be relevant, especially in black-white. So the Knight of Dawn's Light, just an excellent early pick. Getting high-quality two-drops is important, and uh, this is probably the best uncommon monocolor two-drop you can get, in uh, white at least, but I'm sure across most colors. So it gets a B. Definitely a card you want to pick up early, but it also keeps you nice, open and flexible, unlike some of the multicolor uncommons that got a B grade. Next is Leyline Binding, 6 mana enchantment at rare with flash and domain, saying it costs 1 less to cast for each basic land type you control. So again, taking my kind of average normal case scenario where you have 3 basic land types, then this could cost 3 mana. Even in a 2 color deck, it's 4 mana for a flash enchantment that when it enters can exile target a non-land permanent and opponent controls until binding leaves the battlefield. So kind of like a cast out if you just have the two colors, four mana enchantment with flash that takes something out, and cast out is, you know, pretty great removal spell, all things considered. And uh, this has additional flexibility of sometimes being even cheaper, so I think binding gets a B. Next is a Love Song of Night and Day, which is also our first saga of this set. And you'll notice sagas are a little bit different this time around, as they all feature the read ahead mechanic, meaning you can now, when a saga enters a battlefield, instead of always having to start out on chapter one, you can now skip any number of chapters you'd like and uh, start basically from wherever you want. If you don't want to wait to get the benefit from the, the last or maybe the second chapter. Of course, it does mean you maybe lose out on some value if you skip the first chapter, but in this case that may not be a bad thing, because chapter 1 says you and target opponent each draw two cards, which inherently isn't a good thing or a bad thing. It kind of depends on the situation, whether or not you think you benefit more from drawing two than the opponent or vice versa. 
but now you can easily just skip the first chapter if you don't want to make that decision. Go straight to chapter 2 where you get to make a 1-1 white bird creature token with flying. And eventually chapter 3, putting a plus 1 plus 1 counter on each of up to 2 target creatures. So if you're desperate for the plus 1 counters to maybe enable some attacks, you can skip straight to chapter 3. But I think for the most part people will start on chapter 2, make a 1-1 bird and then get the counters. Occasionally, if you think you'll benefit from it more, you'll draw the cards on chapter 1. But uh, just a lot of flexibility is uh, nice to have here. So a love song gets a C plus. Next is a Mesa Cavalier, three mana, two one human knight at common with flying. When it enters the battlefield, you gain two life. Now at first, this seems like an awesome card and reminds you of inspiring overseer from Streets of New Capenna, and then the painful reminder that this doesn't actually draw a card when it enters. So yeah, we got a little bit spoiled by the Overseer. This is still a playable card, you know, 2-1 flyer for 3, a little bit below the curve perhaps, but gains 2 life when it enters. Can maybe enable some small life gain sub-themes, but again, there's not too many of those outside of some higher rarity cards like we saw with uh, Shana, I believe. So yeah, Mesa Cavalier I think just gets a C at the end of the day. Don't think it quite gets to the C plus range but uh, a fine filler card if you need it. Phyrexian Missionary is a 2-mana, two 2-3 two, Phyrexian Human Cleric at Uncommon. Has a lifelink and kicker for 1 and a black, saying when it enters battlefield, if it was kicked, return a target creature card from your graveyard to your hand. So even without kicker, a 2-mana, two 2-3 two, lifelink's already above the curve in terms of uh, stats, but the kicker just pushes this over the top into the B tier. Great value if you're black-white. But even if you're not black-white, I'm still happy enough to play this. Prayer of Binding. 4 mana enchantment at uncommon. Has flash. And when it enters, exiles another non-land permanent. And gains to life until, of course, prayer leaves the battlefield. So it's essentially the same as our Leyline Binding from before except this is always 4 mana and also gains 2 life. So in some decks this will just be a better Leyline Binding in 2 color decks, but uh, we'll never get that uh, full discount that you might get in a domain deck. But uh, yeah, the life gain synergy again could come up if you have something like Shana or some other cards that care about gaining life. So this card seems totally fine, also gets a B, same grade as Leyline Binding. Resolute Reinforcements, 2 mana, 1-1 one, one human soldier at uncommon, has flash, and when it enters, creates a 1-1 one, one white soldier creature token. This is the type of card where you're amazed that it hasn't been printed before, since it seems like a very obvious effect. Kind of a, like a raise the alarm, but instead of making two 1-1 one, one tokens, one is stapled onto a 1-1 one, one creature, so it has a bit of extra synergy with maybe flicker effects or cards that care about casting creatures. So yeah, this card seems great. An ideal way to start out your token curve by making 2-1-1 tokens. And uh, the flash also potentially adds to it. Can maybe pump your the Gryphon Protector we saw earlier at instant speed and try and ambush the opponent that way, play around sorcery speed removal. So having flash definitely comes with a few advantages, maybe setting up some ambush blockers against the opponent's one toughness creatures. So, great card, and uh, happy to have it in my token decks, gets a C+. Runic Shots, a 1-mana sorcery at uncommon, saying destroy target tapped creature. Can also kick it for just a single blue, in which case we also get to scry 2. So, card seems okay even in just a mono-white deck, as a very efficient removal spell. Now it is a sorcery, and only kills tapped creatures, so probably means you'll have to take a hit from an opposing creature first. Pretty awkward against Vigilance, but uh, if you're blue-white especially, two mana to destroy a tapped creature and scry two seems like a very good deal, giving you that additional card selection and still being incredibly efficient. But yeah, it is a sorcery, so won't be able to necessarily prevent taking a hit first, but I think I still like a C-plus for Runic Shot just because of how efficient it is. 
sometimes it's fine to trade a bit of damage for the efficiency and kind of gain a tempo advantage over the opponent. Next is Semite Herbalists, a 2 mana 2-1 two human cleric at common, and when it becomes tapped you gain 1 life and scry 1. Kind of average looking common. Now I will note it does have additional synergy in the set because of the enlist mechanic, so if you can repeatedly tap it with an enlist creature to scry one and gain a life, it becomes a pretty sweet engine that uh, makes it harder for the opponent to race while giving you a card selection. If you don't have any enlist creatures in the deck this is probably not a card I would want to play, but uh, assuming you have a few enlist creatures this seems playable, so we'll give it a C. Sarah Paragon, 4 mana, Angel at Mythic. It's a 3-4 flyer, saying once during each of your turns you may play a land from your graveyard or cast a permanent spell with mana value 3 or less from your graveyard, and if you do, that permanence says if it would be put into a graveyard from the battlefield, exile it, and you gain 2 life. Okay, the Paragon seems awesome. Now, of course, the problem is you're unlikely to have lands in the graveyard ready to be replayed, so you're gonna have to untap with it before getting value, so you know there's a window where the opponent can take it out before you get anything, but uh, if the opponent doesn't have an immediate answer, a 3-4 that will provide a ton of advantage over time seems awesome, and stapled onto a flyer which can also help close out the game. This seems like a bomb level card, I'll give it an A. Then we have Shalai's Acolyte, 5 mana, 3, 4, Angel at Uncommon, and it's a flyer, but can also be kicked for 1 on a green, in which case it enters with 2 plus 1 plus 1 counters on it. So we're never getting an amazing deal, 5 mana, 3, 4, flyer, you know, definitely a fine card, but nothing too exciting. And then a 7 mana, 5, uh, 6, also kind of expensive. But we are getting a lot of flexibility, and you know, 5 6 flyer, no question, can close out the game in a few attacks, so we'll require an immediate answer. So this card seems totally fine and can be a nice addition to maybe your uh, token decks in case the token plan doesn't work out. You still have a flyer to help close out the game, but I'll happily play this in pretty much any white deck, even without the green, but the addition of the green does make it significantly better in the late game. So Acolytes, C+, seems fine. Stall for time, 3 mana instant at common. Can tap up to 2 target creatures, and if this spell was kicked, for 1 and a blue, put a stun counter on each of those creatures. First sighting of stun counters, which are a new mechanic, but it's not like it's something we haven't seen before basically says if a permanent with a stun counter would become untapped, remove one stun counter from it instead. So it's kind of like your freezing effect where the creature doesn't get to untap, but stun counters give the additional flexibility of potentially placing several stun counters to keep the creature tapped down for a longer period of time, and having that like physical reminder of how many turns are left, otherwise it would maybe create some memory issues if you had to keep track of uh, how many turns are left. So a pretty elegant way of uh, solving that problem. And you also get to draw a card, I almost forgot to mention here. So 3 mana, tap 2 creatures down at instant speed and draw a card means we can use it in the opponent's turn before attackers are declared to prevent a big attack, and then those creatures will still be tapped to maybe enable an attack on our side. And if we're also playing blue for 5 mana, we can keep those creatures tapped down for an extra turn cycle, which can quickly add up if we're in a racing situation. So this card can be pretty awesome under the right circumstances. If you're just playing kind of like an average grindy mid-range game, then sometimes this is just going to be 3 mana gain, let's say 4 life draw card, which is not too exciting. But uh, if you're kind of playing more of a tempo game, where you're actively trying to get in damage, this can be a big swing in your favor. So, you know, you have to time it at the right uh, time, of course, to get the full benefit from it. If the opponent can remove your creatures in the meantime, then 
it turns more into a life gain spell as opposed to a way to get an extra damage. So a tricky card to evaluate depends on how your deck is built, but also on the situation during the game itself, so its value can quickly change over time. Could also just play it in a blue-white control deck, just as a way to actually stall for time without going down a card. So that's probably where this card will shine, uh, just kind of like your blue-white control deck. Maybe you've got a few flyers to close out the game, and you just need to make sure you don't get overrun early by some aggressive decks. Although it's also kind of awkward against tokens, as you can only tap two of them down. So against go white decks, it's not quite as effective as you would like it to be. It's going to be much better against, let's say, a green deck where their creatures are large and in charge. But uh, if you can tap those, it'll save you a lot more life in the long run. So a lot of words to basically say I think this card's a C. Fine card, but uh, also don't overrate it. Take up the shield, a 2 mana instant speed combat trick, putting a plus 1 plus 1 counter on a target creature. It gains a lifelink and indestructible until end of turn. That's a lot of keywords for just 2 mana. Means you'll most likely win the trade that's about to happen and gain a bit of life in the process can save a creature from certain removal spells, exile effects will still get them, and uh, you know, minus x minus x type effects if the one counter is not enough. But you also get the lasting benefit of a plus one counter. So this is definitely one of the better comma tricks we've seen so far. I'm hesitant to give two mana comma tricks more than a C grade, but this is certainly a candidate for being a C plus comma trick. I still wouldn't play more than like two of these in most of my white decks. Also, the fact that most of the white decks are token decks means this is a bit less impactful than you might think at first glance. This is much better in like an enlist deck where you're attacking with one larger creature that you can then protect and uh, maybe gain more life in the process. This is going to be a bit weaker in a go white token deck where, you know, saving one token is not all that relevant. So I think the, f the context of a lot of white decks being token decks makes this a little bit weaker than you would think at uh, first glance. So I think I stand by a C, but especially in an enlist deck, this could go up to a C plus and be a great tool to have access to. Next is Temporary Lockdown. Three mana rare enchantment. When it enters the battlefield, exile each non-land permanent with mana value 2 or less, until Lockdown leaves the battlefield. So it's like a mass portable hole, and strangely enough this is probably at its most effective against a white deck, being able to exile tokens, and then even if Lockdown leaves, the tokens don't come back. But uh, yeah, still a powerful effect, and if you have this in your deck, you can sort of plan around it, make sure that the opponent's left with a bunch of creatures that get exiled, whereas you uh, maybe build up towards something bigger. Gonna be at its best in a more controlling strategy, like maybe blue-white, as opposed to your red-white or green-white aggro decks that make a lot of tokens themselves. But the effect is undoubtedly powerful, so I think C plus for lockdown. Urza assembles the Titans, is our first F grade card, simply because it cares about planeswalkers which is not a card type you're going to encounter very often in Limited, so I'm not going to waste too much time on this. Even if your deck happens to have one Planeswalker, I still wouldn't recommend playing this. If you somehow open three or four, then we can start talking, but I think that's not going to come up very often. Next is a Valiant Veteran, 2 mana, 2-2 two, two core soldier at rare, saying author soldiers you control get plus one plus one. Now if you take a look at the list of creatures. Not that many creatures that actually have the soldier creature type, but then you remember that most of the tokens in the set have the soldier creature type, and then veteran makes a lot more sense, and actually becomes a pretty desirable 2-drop. And then for 5 mana we can also exile the veteran from our graveyard to put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on each soldier we control. So yeah, perfect addition to any go wide token deck that makes lots of soldier tokens and uh, I think gets even up to a B grade for the Valiant Veteran. 
if your deck doesn't have any soldiers whatsoever, then this of course becomes pretty unexciting, but still a 2-2 two -two that the opponent might value killing over something else because it's a shiny rare. So, you know, still probably better than most two drops in that case. Wing Mantle Champlain, I think, is our last white card here. Plants the idea of the Defender deck in our mind as a 4 mana 03 Human Cleric at Uncommon, has Defender, and when it enters the battlefield, create a 1 1 White Bird creature token with flying for each creature with Defender you control. So, play Champlain, assuming no instant speed removal in response. You get to make your 1 1 bird token. And then, whenever another creature with Defender enters, you also get to make a 1 1 bird token. So, it also kind of works retroactively. Now, how many Defenders are there in the set? Eh, there's a handful, like maybe 8 or 9. So, you can definitely build a Defender deck, but would I recommend taking Chaplain early and forcing Defenders? I would be hesitant to do that since the payoff here isn't even all that exciting. If you get Chaplain passed to you in the middle of the pack and then late in the pack you get past a whole bunch of defenders and maybe you pick up some other defender payoffs, then, you know, give it a shot. But in general I wouldn't overvalue the Chaplain and it's probably closer to a C. Okay, so that was our last white card and now it's time to move on to blue. Academy Loremaster double blue for a 2-3 human wizard at rare, saying at the beginning of each player's draw step, that player may draw an additional card. If they do, spells if they cast at this turn cost 2 generic more to cast. So a tricky card to kind of parse, but uh, I think this is going to be, of course, at its best in a draw-go style of control deck that has access to a lot of instant speed spells, mostly counter spells, as you can play the Loremaster, then uh, draw the extra card. Doesn't matter that your spells cost two more because you're just gonna pass a turn anyway, and then in the opponent's turn you'll have access to all your instants to still leverage. Now this is a kind of two-sided card in that the opponent can do the same, it's each player's draw step, so they can also decide to draw extra cards and do nothing. So that kind of turns into this weird staring contest where both players are drawing extra cards without necessarily playing anything, but assuming you picked a lore master, you probably built your deck around it more than the opponent, so you'll have more instants to play alongside it. I could see this being a, an awesome card draw engine if you can get it down early. So I'll go with a B with lore master, might be a little bit of a, a higher grade uh, than it actually ends up performing, could end up being a, a little bit weaker than that, but uh, yeah, I'm hopeful that you'll be able to draft around it enough for it to shine. Academy Wall, 2 and a blue for an 05 Defender, and whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, you may draw. If you do, discard only triggers once each turn. So a Looter Wall. Now, as I mentioned when talking about Enlists, I think 05 creatures, just creatures with a lot of toughness and not a lot of power, are going to be slightly weaker than they maybe were in previous sets. Also against tokens, an 05 doesn't discourage any attacks. Getting to loot when casting spells is pretty sweet, so you might still want to play one or two of these in your kind of controlling decks that have a lot of instants, but I still wouldn't uh, take it over a C grade. Might end up closer to like a D. Uh, if my kind of predictions about Enlist and Token decks are right. But then again, there's also the Defender decks, where if you want to have access to a lot of Defenders, you might pick up an Academy Wall or two. So a lot of things to consider, but yeah, C seems fair here. Ether Channeler, a 2-1 for 2 and a blue, when it enters, offers a ton of flexibility can either make a 1-1 bird with flying, can return a non-land permanent to its owner's hand, or can draw a card, and this is a rare. So yeah, ton of flexibility, and uh, all the modes are pretty great. Probably gonna be bouncing something more often than not, but uh, if you're facing a bunch of smaller creatures, then you can maybe draw a card or make a bird. So always gonna be a pretty good deal regardless. So easily gets a B. 
Battlewing Mystic, uh, 2 mana, 2-1, two Bird Wizard, and Uncommon. It flies, and uh, when it enters, can also be kicked for a single red, in which case discard your hands and then draw two cards. So this is kind of a split card, either a 2-mana, two 2-1 two flyer that you want to play as early as possible to start applying pressure with, or if you're empty-handed, ideally, a 3-mana, 2-1 two that draws two, which is still a great deal. So in your blue reds, kind of more aggressively slanted decks that can empty their hand quickly, the Mystic seems like an awesome creature to have access to, and gets a B. Combat Research, a single blue for an enchantment aura at uncommon, enchanting a creature, one of the very few auras in the set. And the enchanted creature says when it deals combat damage to a player, draw a card, so kind of like your curiosity effect. A little bit different in that it's uh, specifically combat damage and not regular damage, so I guess it's closer to Curious Obsession in that way. And as long as the enchanted creature is legendary, it gets plus one plus one and has a ward one. Now ideally we put this type of enchantments on a small evasive creature, and there aren't many legendary small evasive creatures, so it's mostly gonna just give the draw effect without plus one plus one and ward, but occasionally, you know, if the circumstances are right, you can maybe slap this onto a larger legendary creature, so a powerful effect for sure. But uh, when drafting research, just make sure you have enough 1 and 2 mana flyers to maybe pair this with. And uh, there's not a ton of small flyers in the set, but you know, if you take this early enough, you should be able to get your hands on at least 3 or 4 of them. And then uh, combat research could be great, especially if you have other instants to maybe protect your creature. As we'll see, there's like a 1 mana hexproof combo trick that you might be able to pair with it. So, powerful build-around card, and I'm willing to give it a B. Coral Colony, 2 mana, 1-4, wall with Defender at Uncommon. And this is one of those Defender payoff cards that gets better the more Defenders you control. For 1 and a blue, we can tap it, and then target player mills X cards, where X is the number of creatures you control with Defender. So by itself, it mills for 1, pretty slow clock. If you have two or three defenders out, then this turns into a legitimate win condition. So if you can keep the opponent from attacking by just blocking with your defenders, you can turn them into some uh, nice win conditions. So yeah, Colony, not a card I would necessarily want to take early and build my deck around, but if I get past a Colony or two relatively late, then yeah, sure, why not give the defender deck a try? will pair best in kind of your blue-black or blue-white control decks where you have other control elements to pair with your defenders, and then you don't need to worry too much about picking up win conditions, as your win condition is going to be milling out the opponent. We'll give it a C+, since this is actually one of the more legitimate payoff cards and win conditions for the defender deck, whereas there's a lot of other weaker defenders that I wouldn't really want to take unless I already had the payoffs, whereas this is actually a payoff that you can maybe take and then uh, build around a bit more. So you know, we'll try a C+, plus, but I could easily see the Defender deck just being a flop that doesn't really come together very often. Then we've got another Defiler. Defiler of Dreams is the blue one. 5 mana, 4, 3, Phyrexian Sphinx, at rare with flying. Has the same Phyrexian mana ability, where we can pay 2 life instead of a blue to cast our blue permanent spells. And whenever we cast a blue permanent spell, we draw a card. Awesome ability, bomb level card, gets an A. Small side notes, blue probably has fewer permanents as opposed to white. Blue has more instants and sorceries, but drawing a card also more powerful than making a 1-1 token for the most part, so it kind of balances out. Jin of the Fountain, 6 mana, 4-4 four, four, Jin at uncommon with flying. Saying whenever you cast an instant or sorcery, either the djinn gets plus one plus one until end of turn, we can exile the djinn and return it to the battlefield under its owner's control at the beginning of the next end step, aka flicker the djinn, or we can scry one. So, yeah, kind of expensive at six mana, but will be a decent finisher in your blue-red spells decks, or maybe blue-black control or blue-white control 
that will have the most instance and sorceries to go with it. Something to keep in mind if you've got like a cheap cantrip at instant speed, then uh, you might want to keep it available alongside your gin so the opponent can't kill it all that easily. So yeah, fine card, still kind of pricey, gets a C+. Then we've got our signpost 3-mana blue counter spell, like we get in every set. This one has the extra ability of costing a single blue less to cast if an opponent casts two or more spells this turn, and an uncommon as well. Yeah, I'm usually not a big fan of these 3-mana counter spells that cost double blue. This getting a single blue discount probably not going to be super relevant, because if the opponent's double spelling, they're probably not casting a spell that's impactful enough for you to want to counter it in the first place. But you know, it could certainly come up every now and then. But not a card I would take super highly. Gets a C, just kind of expensive to keep up. And if you don't have another instance to sink your mana into it, it's going to lead to a lot of wasted mana that the opponent can maybe play around. Essence Scatter, on the other hand, is... A much better counterspell, I think, especially for limited, where creatures make up the biggest uh, part of your deck, and having a two mana counterspell is much easier to keep up, just a single blue to counter a creature spell. So this I can get behind and get the C plus, but three mana counterspells are a bit clunky. Founding the third path is another one of these read ahead sagas. We can on chapter 1 cast an instant or sorcery spell with mana value 1 or 2 from our hand without paying its mana cost. So kind of like pays for the cost of finding the third path. On chapter 2 we mill four cards or I guess target player but presumably we're milling ourselves and finally, exile target instant or sorcery card from your graveyard, copy it, and you may cast the copy, so we still need to pay its actual mana cost. So this card does a lot of things, but none, none of the things are particularly powerful. Just kind of spinning our wheels, you know, best case scenario, we have like a two mana, either a removal spell or a cantrip we can cast on chapter one, otherwise we can maybe skip ahead to chapter two or three. Problem with skipping to chapter 3 is that we would need to have the mana to cast, founding, and whatever spell we want to replay out of our graveyard. But yeah, sometimes you only have a few removal spells in your deck, and this is a way to double dip on some of them and uh, deal with a problem card from the opponent. It's quite flexible, but none of the modes are particularly powerful, so we'll just give it a C, but some decks might be able to take good advantage of uh, this effect, especially if the card you're getting back from the graveyard is on the cheaper end of the spectrum. Frost Fist Strider, a 5 mana, 4-4 four, four elemental giant at uncommon, has a ward 2, and when it enters the battlefield, tap target creature and opponent controls, and put a stun counter on it, so it's not gonna untap for an extra turn. Reminiscent of Berg Strider, but this has the additional advantage of having ward and not requiring snow mana, so this card seems awesome, if you remember Bergstrider, that card was one of the better blue uh, commons, I believe, so this is an uncommon, rightfully so, because it's quite powerful, gets a B, has an immediate impact on the board, can swing a race in your favor, and a 4-4, especially in blue, is quite large. Next is Haughty Jin, 3 mana, star 4 at rare powers equal to the number of instant and sorcery cards in your graveyard, has flying, and also gives your instant and sorcery spells a 1 mana discount. So kind of like your Enigma Drake with the additional cost reduction and only a single color, so yeah, this card's quite nice, and uh, will fit perfectly in your blue-red spells decks, for instance, where you want to cast lots of instants and sorceries, good in control as well as a finisher that gives you a discount, but probably still a little bit better in a more proactive deck like Blue Red. And uh, yeah, hopefully you can pair it with a lot of cheap cantrips or even like two mana cantrips that now cost a single blue and uh, will help grow its power while digging deeper into the deck and maybe enabling some other synergies along the way. And yeah, for toughness also does a good job on defense if necessary. 
So I think this is a bomb level card. It does require you to build around it a little bit. It's not going to slot in perfectly into just any blue deck. But most of the blue decks are still decks that care about instants and sorceries. So I think this is deserving of an A. Next is Haunting Figment, a 2-mana, two 2-1 two illusion and common with Vigilance. Pretty weird keyword to see in blue. And it cannot be blocked for as long as you've cast an instant or sorcery spell this turn. Okay, so 2-1 with Vigilance, not that exciting, probably just trades off for an opposing 2-drop or maybe even a 1-1 one -one token, which will uh, keep it at bay. But the unblockable ability can be nice in maybe your more aggressive blue-red spells decks. Still not a card I would necessarily prioritize. The fact that it has Vigilance probably doesn't matter too much on just a 2-1 a creature. So we'll give it a C. But could be okay in your uh, more aggressive blue-red decks. Next is Impede Momentum. 2 mana Sorcery at common. Taps target creature and puts three stun counters on it. So we're finally seeing a reason for stun counters because this actually puts multiple counters on a creature. And we also get to scry one. Now we don't actually get to draw a card. So we are kind of down on a card in the exchange. And uh, in return we get to buy ourselves a lot of time against a larger creature. Gonna be pretty bad against a go white token deck gonna be at its best against like a, a green creature deck. For this to be worth it you probably need a lot of like author card draw effects because this puts you down a card. Not a card I really want to main deck very often but I could see it as an okay sideboard card as I mentioned against some larger creatures if you know that uh, you can expect those. You won't be able to play this before the opponent gets a chance to attack at instant speed, like we can with uh, Stall for Time in white. So the opponent immediately gets to remove a stun counter as soon as it's their turn. So yeah, I'm not, not a huge fan of Impede Momentum, but I can see its place in, in some decks, especially after sideboard. So we'll start out with a D. Next is Impulse, 2 mana, instance at common. A reprint letting us look at the top four cards of our library, putting one of them into our hand. Okay, so two mana cantrip it gives us a way to maybe spend our mana if the opponent doesn't play into our counter spells, so it pairs well with cards like Essence Scatter, and we'll see Negate a little bit later too. Can be a nice spell alongside our like Haughty Gin that we covered earlier. Good in your blue red spells deck, I would say, to enable your various synergies that care about casting instants and sorceries just kind of filler for the most part we'll give it a c but has its place in some archetypes next is joint exploration two mana instant and uncommon lets us scry two and then draw so probably worse than impulse for the most part but we can also kick it for a single green in which case we can put a land card from our hand onto the battlefield so all of a sudden it turns into a 3 mana growth spiral that lets us scry to as well. So Occupy is a pretty interesting space. Gonna be at its best in your blue-green ramp decks, especially if they also care about keeping up mana for counter spells. So once again we'll pair well alongside your essence scatter. So if your deck cares about ramping and about keeping up mana, this seems pretty great. If it only cares about one of those two things, then it's probably just like a C level card again. So overall, I think it has the potential of being a C plus. But uh, again, just uh, grade it according to your game plan. Next is a Micromancer for mana three three uncommon human wizard. When it enters, you can search your library for an instant or sorcery with mana value one. Reveal it and put it into your hand. I've taken a look at the list of cards, and there's actually quite a few 1-mana instants and sorceries. Uh, the most, I guess, regular ones you're going to come across are like 1-mana, there's an uncommon uh, fight spell, there's an uncommon black removal spell, there's a couple pump spells. So those are the types of cards you're going to potentially find with a Micromancer. And I think in general, if I'm playing Micromancer, I want to have at least two one-mana spells I can find with it. Otherwise, the risk is too high of just drawing one of them and Micromancer being a four-mana three-three. 
If it actually finds a card, then this is pretty great. So we'll go with C plus for Micromancer. Just make sure you have at least two targets. Next is Negate. We have Essence Scatter and we now also have Negate. This counters a non-creature spell. Not as relevant as countering creature spells in Limited. So this is just a C compared to C plus on Essence Scatter. But sometimes it's nice to have to counter some removal spells from the opponent, for instance. And then the phasing of a Jalfir, 4 mana, read ahead, rare, enchantment saga. And this is a, a pretty tricky one to evaluate. We can on the first two chapters potentially phase out a permanent. A non-land permanent can be either our permanent or uh, the opponent's permanent if we want to for some reason. So in that sense, let's say we play this starting from chapter one. We can phase out the opponent's biggest creature. Chapter 2, phase out their second biggest creature, and maybe attack for lethal. If we didn't kill the opponent in the meantime, then we're in trouble, because on the final chapter, this will destroy all creatures, turning them into 2-2 two, two black Frex and creature tokens. And then, once the phasing goes away, the creatures that we originally phased out come back, and now the opponent still controls their two largest creatures. So we can also have the reverse scenario where we use this to maybe save our two best creatures and then destroy everything. So it's a card with a lot of versatility, but I think either way you slice it, it's still going to be kind of awkward and clunky and doesn't necessarily make up for all the awkwardness and the fact that we actually had to spend four mana casting it. You know, having the, the flexibility of starting from any chapter makes it better than if we had to start from one every time. It doesn't necessarily give the opponent time to react to it. But even in the scenario where we cast this starting chapter three, you know, the best we're doing is probably getting back to parity if we were behind, if the opponent had better creatures out. We just turn them into two twos and everything is kind of equal again, but we spent the card casting it and the opponent didn't. So yeah, flexibility, but is the payoff there? I'm not quite sure. I'm hesitant to give this a super high grade. I'll start out with a conservative C. Could be nice alongside tokens if you have a lot of 1-1s one that you can upgrade into 2-2 two -two creatures. So maybe that's where this card is at its best. But even there it's probably not amazing. Next is Phyrexian Espionage. 3 mana sorcery at common. Can be kicked for 1 and a black. It's basically an upgraded divination we can just draw to, and if it was kicked, the opponent also discards a card. Say no more, this is awesome, C+. Give me as many of these as I can get in my blue-black control decks or my 4-5 color dirtle domain decks. Pixie Illusionist, single blue for a 1-1 fairy wizard at common, it flies. So this is a potential target for our combat research, the enchantment that lets us draw if we hit the opponent. And it can also be kicked for 3 and a green, in which case it enters with 2 plus 1 counters on it. So in that case we're paying 5 mana for a 3-3 three, three flyer. Still not a great rate necessarily, but again we've got the flexibility of uh, also casting it for 1 mana. And we can also tap it, and then target land we control becomes the basic land type of our choice until end of turn. So a few, you know, implications here. This can fix our mana for maybe some splashed kicker effects. This can increase our basic land count for domain, which is probably the most uh, common scenario where we have a couple domain cards. I think I would need some extra, like, incentive to include this in my blue decks. Either I care about Domain a lot, or I have a card like the Combat Research that I want to pair with it. Otherwise it's a bit underwhelming as a 1-1 one -one flyer or, you know, a 5-mana a 3-3 three -three flyer. Maybe in an aggressive blue-red deck that has the blue-red uncommon that pumps the team when we cast non-creature spells. That's another place where I could see Illusionist being worth it, as it can pick up additional power and actually deal quite a bit of damage. I think it might get up to the C plus range, as it can fit into enough archetypes, but uh, probably at its best in like a blue-green base domain deck. 
Then we have Protect the Negotiators, 2 mana instant add on common. And counters target spell unless its controller pays one generic for each creature we control. It can also be kicked for a single white, in which case we create a 1-1 one, one white soldier creature token. So without a kicker, this is a bit of an awkward counter spell, probably worse than Essence Scatter. With the kicker, this is a pretty exciting counter spell that now also makes a 1-1 one, one token. So probably want to be blue-white if we're going to consider playing this, but in blue-white this seems pretty great, since those 1-1 uh, one, one tokens can quickly add up. So I'll go C plus for Protect the Negotiators, and of course the 1-1 one, one token also helps you increase your creature count for the uh, counter spell in the first place. Then we've got a Ronas Vortex, single blue instant at Uncommon, and it's almost an unsummon, um, cannot quite bounce your own creature with it, but just return a target creature or planeswalker even you don't control to its owner's hand, but also as kicker for two and a black, in which case if it was kicked, put that permanent on the bottom of its owner's library instead. So we're used to seeing a lot of these that put it back on top of the opponent's library, this goes straight to the bottom instead, so basically kills it for most intents and purposes, while still having the flexibility of a one mana bounce spell if we need to buy ourselves more time. So yeah, this seems like another great instant speed trick, especially for your blue-black control decks that just want to prolong the game and draw a bunch of cards with a new divination. But uh, yeah, the flexibility here is great as well. So Vortex gets a C+. Shore Up is the one mana hexproof trick I talked about earlier when discussing Combat Research. This is an instant saying target creature you control gets plus one plus one and gains hexproof until end of turn, and we also get to untap it. So a nice little trick. Untapping and giving plus one plus one could maybe help you set up an ambush, but more often than not we're gonna save this for the hexproof to fizzle opposing removal spells. And yeah, if your deck is aggressive enough, again like blue-red spells is what I'm thinking, this could be a nice way to potentially uh, win in the mana exchange if the opponent spends 4-5 mana on their removal spell and you just need to protect with a single blue. If you're kind of the aggressor that can keep up the pressure, that's where Shore Up is going to be at its best. So we'll give it a C, not a card that every blue deck necessarily wants, but in a creature tempo deck Shore Up could be quite nice. Soaring Drake, a 3-mana 2-3 flyer. Very simple, but uh, yeah, the rate is quite nice. Lines up favorably against a lot of flyers we've seen so far, like the 2-1 flyer in white. There's a 2-2 with flash and flying. Even the 2-4 flyer in blue-green wouldn't be able to attack past Soaring Drake to enable its ability. So this blocks relatively well, while still being a threat that can help you close out the game. And uh, yeah, it's an easy common to get access to. So might be tempted to go all the way up to a C plus for Soaring Drake. This seems like it's pretty well positioned. Then we've got Sphinx of Clear Skies, a 5 mana 5-5 five, five Mythic Rare Sphinx with Flying and Ward 2. And it also has Domain. When it deals combat damage to a player, reveal the top X cards of our library, where X is the number of basic lands we control. And then an opponent separates those cards into two piles, put one of the piles into our hand and the other into our graveyard. So what that means is even if we were playing the Sphinx in a mono blue deck, opponent separates into two piles, which is a pile that's empty and a pile that has one card in it, then we can still grab the pile with the one card in it, so we basically draw a card. And that's the worst case scenario, if we have even more land types it gets even better. So yeah, 5-5 five, five flyer with a bit of protection that provides extra card advantage if it hits the opponent. Sounds like a bomb to me. Next is Talos Lookout, 4 mana, 3-2 human pirate at common, it flies, and when it dies, look at the top two cards of your library, putting one of them into your hand and the other in your graveyard. This is awesome for a common, it's 
applying meaningful pressure as a 3-2 flyer, and most of the time that the opponent answers it, it's going to die and draw a card all the way out. I think this might get all the way up to the B for a lookout. Definitely a close one, like it's a very high C and maybe a low B, but uh, I think I think it might actually get there just as a, a nice two for one at common. Tight pool, turtle, four mana, two five, turtle at common. So kind of like your wish coin crab stats, but it's uh, got a, a nice little upgrade for two and a blue. We get to scry one. Not a super impactful ability, but it's just a nice little upside. So this will be a nice defensive creature to play in your more controlling decks where you want to pass with a bunch of mana up. If the opponent doesn't force you to use your counter spell, maybe you get to scry one instead. Yeah, fine filler card, nothing too exciting. Don't need to prioritize it, you'll get these pretty late. Gets a C. Timely Interference, single blue instant at common. Saying target creature gets minus one, minus O until end of turn. If the spell was kicked for one and a red, that creature blocks this turn if able, and most importantly, draw a card. So I think you're very happy to play this outside of blue red. Just if you're playing a blue deck, the one downside is that you cannot cast it if there's no creature in play to target, but that shouldn't be much of an issue. And then it can randomly be a, a blowout if you line up the right blocks. It can actually kill a creature and draw a card, perhaps, for one mana. So you'll have to be very mindful if the opponent has blue mana available. But also in the blue-red spells decks, this is a cheap cantrip to enable your synergies. And occasionally, you'll be able to use a kicker ability to actually take out a key creature from the opponent by forcing them to block, and then you can just maybe attack with one creature that you're happy to trade or maybe even eat an opposing creature. So this seems awesome. C plus for interference. Tolarian Geyser, 3 mana, sorcery at common. Returning a creature to its owner's hands and drawing a card. Can also kick it for single white, in which case we gain 3 life. Now the big drawback here is sorcery, so it's not quite your repulse that you can play at instant speed. But it does replace itself, so this will be like okay bouncing a token, drawing a card, which basically kills it, although most tokens are 1 1s. And it will be pretty decent against green decks where the opponent may be spending a lot of mana casting a big, dirtily creature, and then you get a small mana advantage by bouncing it and drawing. So, yeah, playable card. I wouldn't overrate it because it's a sorcery, but it gets a C. Tolarian Terror, 7 mana, 5-5, five, five, a serpent at common. And this is part of that cycle I mentioned. White cares about controlling creatures to get a discount. This one cares about having instant and sorcery cards in your graveyard, and a 5-5 five, five with ward too. So another reason to like all those cheap cantrips, like the uh, one we just covered at 1 mana, the interference, and then at 2 mana there's impulse as another one of those cantrip effects that can help fill the graveyard for Tolarian Terror. So a decent finisher for your blue spell decks. So going to be at its best in blue-black control, blue-red spells, and the more controlling blue-white variants. And uh, overall gets a C. I think you'll be able to pick these up pretty easily. A 4-mana Mythic Rare Enchantment saying whenever you cast a spell that targets only a single artifact or creature you control, Create a token that's a copy of that artifact or creature, except it's not legendary. So there's not too many ways to get free value out of the Diplomacy. Mostly cards like the uh, Timely Interference, which we just covered, which can draw cards and then maybe make a free token in the process. Maybe you've got a few pump spells that can randomly make a token. But uh, yeah, it's going to require a bit of work to get it going. So not super high grade for this uh, Mythic Rare Enchantment but could be fun if you can actually enable it, so we'll go with the C. Next is Voda C Scavenger, 3 mana, 3 2, Merfolk Rogue at common, and has Domain, saying when it enters the battlefield, look at the top X card of your library, where X is the number of basic lands you control, and put one of those on top and the rest on the bottom in a random order. 
So it doesn't draw a card, it just gives you a bit of card selection. So assuming a two color deck to start out, get to look at top two cards, put one on top, rest on the bottom. And then the more colors you have, the better it gets in the late game. So yeah, fine three drop. I will see a colorless three drop that's a three two that lets you scry two when it enters. So it's kind of in the same ballpark. Merfolk can be a relevant creature type since there's a rare lord, although that one's not particularly great, so not a reason to include scavenger in your decks for that one. But just a filler C level card, nothing special here. Next is the Hexcatcher, which is I guess the lord I was just talking about, a 1-1 at rare with flash, saying other merfolk you control get plus one plus one. Can also be sacrificed or sacrifice any merfolk to counter target non-creature spell unless its controller pays one generic mana. So you can use the hex catcher as kind of a bad negate to maybe uh, catch the opponent off guard. A 1-1 one is not particularly great at ambushing opposing creatures, so this feels pretty weak. We'll go with the D for hex catcher, better reserved for constructed formats where it'll be a lot better. And then the Vodalian Mind Singer is pretty great. A 3 mana 2 2 Merfolk Wizard at rare. Can be kicked with 1 on a red and or 1 on a green. For each time it was kicked, it gets 2 plus 1 counters. And when it enters the battlefield, it gain control of target creature with power less than the Mind Slinger's power for as long as you control it. So hopefully we can at least make it a 4 4 and then steal maybe a 3 powered creature, maybe even a flyer from the opponent. And this will be pretty great if the opponent can get rid of it. And best case scenario, we can play this for, um, I guess it would be 7 mana. And then get a 6-6 a six, six that can steal up to a 5-powered creature from the opponent. So yeah, this can be very impactful if the opponent ran out of answers for it. So seems like a bomb level card. Next is Silver, Scrutiny, X and Double Blue for a rare sorcery. Let's just draw X cards. And if X is 3 or less, we can play this as though it had Flash. So it turns into an instant. And yeah, 3 mana for the X means 5 total. Kind of like Jace's Ingenuity to draw 3. Which is still a very great card and has the flexibility of late game sinking a whole bunch of mana into it. So this will be at its best in the blue-green ramp decks, where uh, you've got more mana to spend on the X, but will be great in any blue deck pretty much. At the very least, a B for Scrutiny. And then we've got the Tide Turner, 2 mana, 1-3 Merfolk Wizard at common. Can tap to add blue. Can only spend it to cast an instant or sorcery or a kicked spell. So similar to the 1-3 from the original Dominaria that's made a mana for instance and sorceries, this has the advantage of also casting kicked spells. So if you're casting a creature with kicker, it can help there as well. But if you actually look at the list, not too many creatures that have kicker where the one mana would be useful that especially require blue mana as well. So it's more of like a corner case. So for the most part, a 1-3 that will be okay in your uh, blue spell decks that wants an early blocker to maybe soak up some damage from random tokens while helping you cast your more expensive instants and sorceries, especially if they also have kicker. So fine playable, won't go higher than a C, but some decks will appreciate it more than others. So time to move on to black. Our first black card is Aggressive Sabotage. 3 mana sorcery at common, and says target player discards 2 cards, so our typical mind rot effect, but we can also kick it for single red, in which case it deals 3 damage to that player. So yeah, fine upgrade over your typical mind rot will be nice, especially in black red to get that extra damage, and single red to deal 3 damage is a pretty good rate, so if you're already in the market for a discard effect, this will make it even better. And from what I've seen so far, Dominaria does look like it can lead to some grindy games. So a discard 2 effect might be better than it's been in some previous formats where there was either a lot of graveyard synergy to make the discard less relevant, or maybe the format was just too aggressive for discard to be worth it. 
So I'll give Sabotage a, a playable rating of uh, a C here. Next is the Balduvian Atrocity, 3 mana, 2, 3, at uncommon with Menace, and can also be kicked for single reds, in which case when it enters, we can return a creature card with mana value 3 or less from our graveyard to the battlefield. It gains haste, and we have to sacrifice it at the beginning of the next end step. Black Reds is the deck that cares about sending creatures in the red zone and creatures dying in the red zone as well, so this fits that archetype perfectly. If we're not playing reds and just playing a 3 mana 2 3 with menace, it's not all that exciting, but assuming you're playing reds, this gets up to the C plus range. Next is Battle Rage Blessing, another pretty powerful combo trick, and we've seen a few of these so far. 2 mana instant saying target creature gains death touch and indestructible until end of turn. Death touch and indestructible means your creature is going to survive, whereas the opponent's creature is likely dying in the process. So pretty much what you want out of your combo tricks. Uh, does not deal any additional damage, I guess is the downside. So can't use it to push more damage through. But uh, yeah, still seems like a great little trick. Probably don't want too many of these in your decks, but as a one or two of, it can maybe replace removal if you didn't get uh, lucky enough to open up any of those. So we'll go with C for Blessing. Next is Battle Fly Swarm. Single black for a 1 1 Phyrexian insect at common. It has flying, and for single black, it gains Death Touch until end of turn. I have a lot of good things to say about Swarm. First off, there's not too many ways in this set to punish one toughness creatures, especially if they are flying. This can get in some good chip damage early, as there's not too many other flyers that can stop it. So especially in like your aggressive black-red decks, I think this will be great. But then it's also a great defensive tool, as it can stop both flyers and ground creatures. Just requires you to keep up a single black for death touch. So also in your grindy black-green mid-range decks, for instance, where you can get the swarm back from the graveyard very easily, it can be a nice alternative for just your regular removal spells. And if you're playing blue-black, for instance, it can maybe even wear the enchantment to draw cards. So swarm has a ton of flexibility without a ton of ways to really punish the 1-1 flyer. So yeah, C plus easily for Battlefly Swarm. Then we've got a Blight Pile, 2 mana, 3-3, three, three, Phyrexian Defender at Uncommon. So part of the Defender payoff cards. As for 2 and a black, we can tap it, and each opponent loses X life, where X is the number of creatures with Defender we control. And a 3-3 three, three does a pretty good job of blocking early, unlike some of like the O5 walls we've seen, if the opponent's attacking with an Alist creature on the ground, this will pretty much always trade for it. So you don't have to worry about the opponent getting free attacks in with her endless creatures or 1-1 tokens. So this actually discourages attacks. And then if you can discourage attacks long enough, you can turn it into a win condition by draining the opponent to death. So yeah, nice card to take like relatively early. And if you happen to pick up a few of these, then maybe keep your eyes open for author defenders and payoffs for defenders. But even without any other defender synergies, this is potentially playable in a more controlling deck. So we'll give it a C+. Bone Splinters is going to be one of the key removal spells in the format. And uh, yeah, of course, a reprint we've seen a few times now. As an additional cost to cast it, we have to sacrifice a creature and then destroy target creature for just a single black at sorcery speed. So this will be excellent in black-white, where you can make a bunch of random tokens and you have a bit of uh, sacrifice synergy. Black Reds has a ton of great ways to leverage Bone Splinters, as we've already seen making 2-1 elemental tokens we can sacrifice with the Black Red Uncommon. We've got the uh, Kicker card that brings a creature back that has to be sacrificed. We can maybe take out with uh, Bone Splinters as well. So a lot of great synergy, and uh, this is going to be one of the key removal spells in the format. Still, you know, sometimes can be awkward if you don't have the right enablers for it. You don't really want a two for one yourself, but uh, at least a C plus. 
Then we've got Breeds, Arisen, a Nightmare, 3 mana, 3-3, three, three, a Legendary Nightmare at Rare. And says at the beginning of your end step, you may sacrifice an artifact, or a creature, or an enchantment, or a land, or a planeswalker. If you do, each opponent may sacrifice a permanent that shares a card type with it. For each opponent who doesn't, that player loses two life and you draw a card. So the May Sacrifice is what kind of makes this a lot less exciting than it could have been otherwise, since the opponent's always free to just let you draw a card and give up two life instead. Now that being said, it's still pretty easy to leverage Braids in your, like, let's say, Black-Red Sacrifice decks like we've just discussed, or your Black-White Token decks where you can give up a token in exchange for potentially two life and a card from the opponent, so... There's still a lot of great synergies with Braids, and also just a 3 3 for 3 mana, so the fail case isn't too bad here. So we'll give Braids a B. Next is Braids Frightful Return. 3 mana, read ahead, Saga. First chapter, you may sacrifice a creature. If you do, each opponent discards a card. Although we can easily skip the first chapter and start on chapter 2, returning a creature card from our graveyard to our hand. Definitely seen those before in black. And finally, target opponent may sacrifice a non-land, non-token permanent. If they don't, they lose to life and you draw a card. So, yeah, if we get the second and third chapter's value, it's probably worth 3 mana. So they won't even be able to sacrifice 1-1 one -one soldier tokens. So, yeah. Seems like a pretty powerful saga, all things considered, and going to be at its best if you can also maybe make use of the first chapter and sacrifice something you don't care about. But uh, even with chapter 2 and 3, it's still pretty good. So we'll give it a C+. Choking Miasma is the 3 mana minus 2 minus 2 sweeper of the set. So a sorcery at uncommon. And we can also kick it for single green, in which case we can put a plus one plus one counter on a creature you control. And that can make a huge difference. All of a sudden, you can actually save one of your creatures from the minus two minus two and have a permanent plus one counter bonus. And given that so many of the white decks in the format care about making lots of tokens and going wide, the minus two minus two is going to be a lot more impactful than you might uh, think at first glance. So I think Miasma will be powerful enough to get a B grade here. Then we've got the Cruelty of Gix. 5 mana, a rare saga. Chapter 1 says target opponent reveals their hand. You can choose a creature or planeswalker to make them discard. Chapter 2 can search our library for any card and put it into our hand at the cost of 3 life. So we've got our Grim Tutor here. And finally, put a creature card from any graveyard onto the battlefield under your control. So you can maybe even reanimate whatever we discarded on the first chapter. All three chapters combined provide a ton of value. You can skip chapter one if the opponent's empty-handed, otherwise I'm probably getting all three. So this card seems great, bomb level card for sure. Next is Cult Conscript, one mana, two one, a skeleton warrior at uncommon. And Enters the battlefield tapped. For one and a black, we can return it from our graveyard to the battlefield if a non-skeleton creature died under our control this turn. Okay, seems like a nice recursive threat. Can apply a bit of pressure early, and then late game can still be a nice kind of sacrifice engine in your, you know, black-red or black-white decks mostly. Seems pretty decent, C+. Cut down is going to have a very big impact in Constructed, mostly as a 1 mana instant speed removal spell at Uncommon, saying destroy target creature with total power and toughness 5 or less. So this can kill a 3 2 for 1 mana, can kill a 2 3, cannot kill a 3 3, but can kill, you know, a 4 1. So a lot of flexibility here for 1 mana. Probably not going to be as good as Fatal Push in older formats but for standard, mostly going to be a nice one-mana option. And for limited, also seems pretty good, as it's so efficient and uh, can also kill like evasive creatures that tend to have smaller power and toughness combined, but of course a ton of utility from other keywords, and this only really cares about the total power and toughness. So we'll give it a B. 
Defiler of Flesh is the Black Defiler, part of the cycle. A 4 4 Phyrexian Horror and Rare with Menace, having the discount for Black Permanence if we pay 2 life. And whenever we cast a Black Permanence spell, target creature you control gets plus 1 plus 1 and gains a Menace until end of turn. This ability, probably the weakest of the ones we've seen so far, would rather make a 1 1 token or draw a card. But a 4 4 Menace for 4 is also very cheap to get in play, so we can leverage the ability a couple turns sooner than the other defilers we've seen so far, so still easily an A. Drag to the bottom is a rare sweeper in this set, a sorcery for 4 mana, saying each creature gets minus X minus X until end of turn, where X is 1 plus the number of basic land types among lands you control. So in a 2 color deck it's going to be minus 3 minus 3, but in a dedicated domain deck could be up to minus 6 minus 6, so a very powerful sweeper, and you can sort of time it if you can keep some land types in hand, so you have the appropriate size of a uh, drag to the bottom, so you can maybe keep some of your creatures alive while killing the opponent's stuff. But for the most part, even at just minus 3 for each creature, it's quite powerful. So we'll give it an A. And we'll certainly have an impact in constructed format. Eerie Soul Tender, 3 mana, 3-1 three Spirit Cleric at common. When it enters, it mills 3 cards. And there's quite a few decks that can uh, leverage the self-mill between Graveyard Recursion, but also having creatures that care about having a full graveyard. And then for 4 in the black, we can exile this from our graveyard to return another target creature card from our graveyard to our hand. Yeah, that's pretty nice value kind of expensive and slow at 5 mana, but we're just getting free value on top of a 3-1. Maybe there's other ways to mill it so it doesn't have to even die first to end up in our graveyard. So it seems like a solid role player for some of the black graveyard decks. We'll give the Eerie Soul Tender a C+. Evolved Sleeper, one of the first cards that got previewed of the set, a 1-1 a rare human can upgrade it into a 2-2 human cleric, then we can upgrade it into a 3-3 Phyrexian human cleric, and finally we can start drawing extra cards with it at the cost of one life as well, and putting a counter on it. So it takes a while to get going, but if it goes unopposed it will grow into huge threats while drawing extra cards. So we'll give the Evolved Sleeper B. Extinguish the Lights is going to be this set's murder, a 4 mana instant, destroying a creature or planeswalker, and small bonus if the mana value was 3 or less we also gain 3 life. So 4 mana, murder, still quite good, and will probably be the B level common in black, and uh, probably the best removal spell at common in black as well. Next we've got the Gibbering Barricade, 3 mana, 2 for Nightmare Wall at common, has Defender. For 2 and a black we can sacrifice any creature, including the Barricade itself, to gain 1 life and to draw a card. So pretty decent as a 2-4, since it can actually discourage some attacks for 3 mana. Of course you want to play this in your more controlling decks, but even in like maybe a black-white sacrifice deck this could be a nice sacrifice engine to turn some of your tokens into extra cards, could be okay in black-red, even though black-red tends to be more aggressive and wanting to attack with its creatures to enable some of its synergies, this could still function as a nice sacrifice outlet. So it is kind of awkwardly positioned in that way. Um, a deck like blue-black control, which will appreciate the 2-4 blocker more than the sacrifice effect, can also still maybe make use of it and it's also Defender for potential Defender synergies, which seem to be centered mostly in like blue, black, and white, so the Esper colors. So yeah, Barricade, a solid role player, never gonna be amazing in any deck, but definitely a playable card. Knight of Dusk's Shadow is the counterpart of our White Knight. This 2-mana, uh, 2-2 two 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 Human Knight at Uncommon with Menace saying your opponents cannot gain life. It's another way to maybe shut down the life gain decks in Constructed. 
And for one on a black, the knight gets plus one plus one until end of turn. So another nice pump ability. Mana's probably weaker than first strike, so I think I prefer the white knight over the black one here, but they're both amazing two drops and still gets a B. And Liliana of the Veil finally gets a reprint in standard. Three mana planeswalker can plus one to make each player discard a card. Minus two is often where we're gonna start making target player sacrifice a creature. And the minus six also very devastating if we can get to it, separating the opponent's stuff into piles, and then the opponent can choose one and sacrifice the rest, including their lands as well. So Liliana, very powerful, gonna see a ton of play in standard, I'm sure, and potentially some other formats as well on Arena. And uh, yeah, this card's great and limited as well, especially if you can protect Liliana. The lower curve your deck is, probably the better, that way you're not as concerned about discarding lands to the plus one, you can empty your hand, and then if you're empty-handed while the opponent still has cards in hand, and you're using the plus one, you're getting way more advantage out of it, of course. And then even the play pattern of using Liliana, activating the minus two, having both players discard with the plus one, and then using the minus two a second time, you already probably got quite a bit of value in the process. So yeah, this card's awesome. Um, can be a little bit weak or disappointing in the late game if there's a fully developed board and players are empty-handed. That's probably the exception, but for the most part, I think Liliana deserving of an A. Monstrous a War Leech, 4 mana, star star, and uncommon. And power and toughness are each equal to the highest mana value among cards in your graveyard and can also be kicked for a single blue, in which case when it enters, mill four cards, which can then enable its power and toughness as well. So there's a couple cards with an incredibly high mana value in this set. There's an entire cycle of them actually, with uh, the black common one having a mana value of seven, and uh, I believe the green one goes up to eight. So a lot of potentially expensive cards to synergize with a War Leech, that's the best case scenario, but even on average, maybe like turning this into a 4 mana 3-3 three, three or 4-4 four, four that can potentially grow over time isn't too bad. And uh, it doesn't even specify creatures, can also be a removal spell with a high mana value to power it up. So yeah, seems like a pretty decent card and uh, can potentially enable some of the Sultai, I would say, like blue-black-green graveyard decks. So we'll give it a C plus to start out. Phyrexian Rager reprinted as well, and definitely a card that uh, I like a lot. 2-2, uh, two, two, that when it enters the battlefield, draws a card at the cost of one life. Just puts into perspective how ridiculous Inspiring Overseer was in Streets of New Capenna, being a 2-1 flyer that gains one life and draws a card. This is still great though replaces itself with a card right away, a 2-2 is a relevant body in play, probably a price we're willing to pay for this effect. think I'm uh, willing to go all the way up to a B for Frax and Rager, definitely a lower B, but at the very least a very high C+. Next is Fraxian Vivisector, 2 mana, 2-2, two, two, saying whenever a creature you control dies, scry 1, a Fraxian human at common. Yeah, this is pretty decent for a 2-drop. It's a nice creature to play early to potentially attack and block with, and then late game it will provide a lot of value over time as more creatures die. So whenever we have a 2-drop that's still relevant in the late game, you've got my attention. So we'll go C plus for Vivisector. We'll be at its best in black-white and black-red. Phyrexian Warhorse, a 4 mana, 3-3 three, three Phyrexian Horse at common, and can pay 1 mana, sacrifice another creature to give it plus 2 plus 1 until end of turn. So a threat of activation, also very important for this type of card. And we can also kick the Warhorse, I wouldn't do it in real life, but single white, in which case when it enters, create a 1-1 one, one white soldier creature token. So that will give us some sacrifice fodder to enable its other ability. So, yeah, fine card, especially if you can also kick it without kicker. Kind of medium, 
but we'll go with a uh, C plus for the Warhorse. Pilfer, a two mana sorcery at uncommon. Target opponent reveals their hand. You can choose a non land card from it, that player discards that card. I'm usually not a huge fan of targeted discard effects in Limited, since they often end up like that top deck since the late game, and this one doesn't even exile the card, or if the opponent's empty handed, Agonizing Remorse from Theros at least got to maybe exile a card from a graveyard. So this is a very weak version of that effect. I think I would rather just play a Mind Rot and get my 2 for 1 value instead. But if the opponent is somehow packing an unbeatable bomb, your deck doesn't have any removal, and you're in sideboarded games, I could see siding this in, but it's probably a pretty uh, desperate attempt. So I would go with uh, a D for Pilfer. And then we've got the Raven Man. 2 mana, 2-1, two legendary human wizard at rare, saying at the beginning of each end step, if a player discarded a card this turn, create a 1-1 one, one black bird creature token with flying, and that token cannot block, can pay 4 mana, tap it, and each opponent discards a card, can only be used as a sorcery. So it enables itself, and uh, yeah, maybe you can even pair it with some other discard effects, but discard seems quite awesome, easily a B, and could also see some constructed play alongside Liliana of the Veil. Sangir Connoisseur, a 5 mana, 3-3 three, three vampire at uncommon, it flies, and says whenever one or more author creatures die, put a plus on plus one counter on it, only triggers once each turn. Starts out kind of small for 5 mana, but will quickly grow over time and also grows off your own creatures dying, can trigger during your turn and the opponent's turn, basically getting two plus one counters in a turn cycle potentially. Doesn't take much for this to uh, potentially get out of hand, so at the very least a C plus. Shadow Prophecy is the three mana common card draw effect in black. This is an instant, so it could pair well in a control deck and also a domain card, which is kind of strange since we don't have many domain cards in black, but let's just look at the top X cards of our library, where X is the number of basic land types among lands we control. So we don't want to play this in a mono black deck, I can tell you that much, because you can put up to two of those cards into your hand and the rest into your graveyard at the cost of two life. So if you only have swamps in play, this is only drawing one card, but uh, yeah, instant speed in a two or three color deck, it becomes a bit more interesting. But uh, the instant speed means you can maybe keep it up alongside counter spells. Putting stuff in the graveyard can also be relevant in your black green decks. So it certainly has a place. Still probably just a C. Then we've got Shadow Rite Priest, part of the cycle of lords that care about certain creature types. This uh, 2 2 human cleric at rare saying other clerics you control get plus one plus one. But there's more. For five mana, we can tap and sacrifice another cleric to search our library for any black creature card and put it straight onto the battlefield. So, a very powerful effect. Now, there's not a ton of clerics in this set, I've checked, so the plus one plus one not going to be super impactful. But the random ability of uh, searching of a black creature. There are a few expensive ones in the sets, so that could come up. And uh, at the end of the day, it's still a 2-mana two 2-2 two, two that maybe pumps one or two creatures at some point. So not a super high pick, but probably still a C+. Next is Shieldred, the Apocalypse. 4-mana, four 4-5, four a legendary Phyrexian Praetor at Mythic, has Death Touch. And whenever you draw a card, you gain 2 life. Whenever an opponent draws a card, they lose two life. So definitely don't want to cast the Divination when facing Shieldred. Yeah, this card's great. It doesn't have any built-in protection, no real ETB effect, although you could argue the opponent untapping and drawing and losing two life is kind of like an ETB effect. But if this card goes unopposed, it's gonna run away with the game very quickly. A 4-5 for 4 with Death Touch is great stats to start out. 
So yeah, this card's a bomb for sure. Don't think it quite gets to the S tier though. Shieldred's Restoration, 4 mana, Uncommon Sorcery, returning target creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield. Typically reanimation effects cost 5 mana, so this is a nice 1 mana discount. But we have to pay for it with our life total, because we have to lose life equal to that card's mana value. So kind of like the 1 mana reanimate from uh, standards past. This still costs 4 mana, so... You know, not the best rate in that sense. But we can also cast it with Kicker for 2 and a white, in which case instead of paying life we gain life equal to that card's mana value. Alright, but then we're paying 7 mana for this effect, which is pretty pricey and I'm kind of losing interest. So both halves of the card are somewhat questionable. 4 mana, but then you have to pay a bunch of life. 7 mana, but then you gain life. So I'm not particularly excited by either half. Might have some constructed applications where life total is probably less relevant than the mana discount, but for limiteds I'm hesitant to give it a very high grade. So I'll start with a C. Next is Splatter Goblin, 2 mana, 2-1 two Frexing Goblin at common. When it dies, target creature and opponent controls gets minus 1, minus 1 until end of turn. So a cute little 2-drop here that plays well in your sacrifice decks, but even in an aggressive creature deck this attacks pretty well and discourages the opponent from blocking, especially if they have some valuable 1-toughness creatures. I mentioned there not being a lot of ways to punish 1-toughness, but this is one of them. If you can maybe sacrifice it and take out an important 1-toughness creature from the opponent. And uh, yeah, this can attack pretty well even in the late game as it can potentially get past three toughness creatures with the effect. So C plus for Splatter Goblin. Decent early two drop, that's still somewhat relevant in the late game. We've got Stronghold Arena up next, two mana a rare enchantment. And this is a tricky one to evaluate, can kick it for both the green and or white, gaining three life for each time it was kicked. And then it sort of provides a dark confident-like ability, but it requires us to hit the opponent to do so. Whenever one or more creatures we control deal comma damage to a player, we may reveal the top card of our library and then put it into our hands, but we have to pay a life equal to its mana value. So lands are free, but spells cost life, which is why we can kick this to gain some life and uh, take advantage of it. So ideally we can pair this with like a cheap evasive creature, like maybe the uh, one mana Battlefly Swarm at common. That's probably the best synergy with Arena, as you can get it going on turn two already. But uh, otherwise, maybe pairs best in a more aggressive deck like Black Red, but then you don't get the benefit from Kicker. So maybe Black White, where you've got a bunch of tokens. This could also work quite well. So. Definitely a powerful card draw engine, requires a bit of setup, can just throw this into any deck and expect it to perform. Need to have a plan for how you're gonna connect with the opponent. But if you can, and maybe have some life gain to offset it, then it could be a pretty sweet card draw engine. So yeah, difficult one to evaluate. I'll start out with a more hopeful B grade, but could see it going down a bit. Next is Tattered Apparition, 4 mana 2-2 two, two flyer, and it's a common shade, and as we all know, shades in magic, you can pay mana to pump them. This is 1 on a black to get it plus 1 plus 1 until end of turn. So it's not the most efficient creature to start out, 4 mana 2-2 two, two flyer is uh, at least 1 more mana than we want to pay for it, and then it's 1 on a black to get plus 1 plus 1. So kind of pricey to get in play. Not great if you're on the back foot, but if you're the aggressor, then it's an evasive creature that can actually deal a significant amount of damage. So I don't really mind it if uh, your deck is aggressive enough. Overall, can give it more than a C. And then we've got the Toxic Abomination, 2 mana, 3 2 Fraxian Zombie at common. When it enters, you lose 2 life. Don't see drawbacks on creatures very often, except for, I guess, the Frexian Rager, but that's a reprint. 
So yeah, the Abomination doesn't excite me very much. A 3-2 at 2 mana often just trades for the opponent's 2-drop, which probably didn't cost him any life to begin with. So we're down 2 life for no good reason. Best case scenario, we're an aggressive deck and the opponent misses their 2-drop and now we've got a 3-powered creature attacking. But uh, even then, you know, it's probably not worth uh, 2 life most of the time. So a rare D. Tribute to Urborg, 2 mana instant at common, giving a creature minus 2 minus 2 until end of turn, which is a nice little removal effect. Can kill a 2 toughness creature, but can also pair it with uh, attacks and blocks to maybe take out something bigger. And can also be kicked for 1 and a blue, in which case it gives an additional minus 1 minus 1 until end of turn for each instant and sorcery card in our graveyard. So this will shine in your blue-black control decks that have lots of cantrips and other instants and sorceries that end up in the graveyard, and then it could easily be 4 mana, just destroy target creature pretty much, which we gave a B to the uh, Extinguish the Light. I don't think this quite gets to the B uh, category, but at the very least a C+, plus, as it's still totally fine for 2 mana. I'll happily play this even if I don't have blue for kicker, but in blue-black specifically this gets even better. Urborg Repossession, single black for a sorcery, returning a target creature card from your graveyard to your hand. Can also be kicked for one and a green, but regardless, you gain two life. And if you did kick it, then you can also return another target permanent card from your graveyard to your hand. So it says permanent, so it doesn't have to be two creatures, it could be a creature and an enchantment, for instance. So that's a small distinction there. Um, yeah, repossession, a fine. Uh, raise that type effect, and especially in black-green where you can kick it, it seems pretty decent. Outside of black-green, probably not very interested if it's only one creature, but if you can get a full two for one, I'm all for it. So we'll go C plus for repossession in the right deck. And a writhing necromass is the common in black that gets a discount if we meet a certain requirement. In this case, one less to cast for each creature card in our graveyard. And yeah, this one's going to be a little bit more difficult to enable early on in the game, since you're not always going to get the trades you want for creatures to end up in the graveyard. But for the most part, still realistic to cast this around 5 mana if two creatures are in the graveyard. So then we get a 5-mana 5-5 Death Touch, which is not a bad rate. But uh, if you're playing a more dedicated self-mill deck, then uh, you could easily cast this for even cheaper. Great synergy with that uh, Leech that has power toughness equal to the highest mana value in Graveyard, in which case it could be a 7-7. So we'll give this a C, as we did with the other commons of this cycle in other colors. Time to move on to Red. Balduvian Berserker, 3 mana, 1 3 core Berserker at uncommon, and another card with enlist. And when it dies, it deals damage equal to its power to any target. So, assuming we can enlist a creature and increase its power, it's gonna discourage the opponent from blocking, otherwise, it's gonna die and potentially take something else out once it does end up uh, biting the dust. So kind of means almost like the Berserker has unblockable to a certain extent, but you can also leave the Berserker back on defense, in which case it basically has a virtual two power that you can split up and maybe take out several one toughness creatures or just trade for a two toughness creature. So it's a card with a lot of versatility and uh, can also potentially pair well with other pump spells, even on defense, to take out several creatures. Starting out, it only has one power, so do need to pair it with something else before it uh, really does much. So, tricky card to evaluate. I'm going to start out with a more conservative C grade, as it does require a bit of work to get going, but uh, could easily be surprised by how good this is in maybe even a sacrifice deck where you can sacrifice it to force the issue. Chaotic Transformation. A 6-mana rare sorcery, 
and it's kind of like a mass transmogrify effect that hits several card types. So we can exile up to one target artifact, up to one target creature, enchantments, planeswalker, and or land. And for each permanent exiled this way, its controller reveals cards from the top of their library until they reveal a card that shares a card type with it and put it onto the battlefield. So this card's pretty crazy. Um, I wouldn't say it's crazy good, but uh, can still lead to some interesting scenarios, especially if the opponent maybe only has uh, one card with a certain card type in their deck, in which case this just removes that card. So that maybe works with enchantments, which some people may only have one of in their deck. Unlikely to work with other card types, I guess Planeswalker is another one of those. I wouldn't recommend putting transformation in your deck, since typically it's a bit of a waste of mana, and you might even uh, upgrade the opponent's creature by accident, but it could also be kind of a last ditch effort to get rid of the opponent's bomb, and then you're okay with them getting something else in return. Could also use this on your own creatures technically, um, but it's also unlikely to really work out in your favor. So we'll give transformation a either a D or an F. I'll go with F. I think you should probably avoid playing this. Coalition War Brute, four mana, three four Minotaur Berserker at common, and it has both enlist and trample. And I really like when my enlist creatures have some form of evasion. Flying is one of them, trample also counts, as it'll make it harder for the opponents to chum block and win the race that way. And this is pretty beefy starting out, a 3-4 for 4, already decent stats, and you can easily increase its power even more, and uh, potentially force maybe a double block to take it out. So the War Brutes seems like one of the better endless creatures we've seen so far, especially for a common, so it gets a C+. Defiler of Instincts, 4 mana, a rare Phyrexian Kavu, part of the Defiler cycle, so this is uh, a 4 for first strike, and then it gets the same mana discount for life when casting red permanent spells. And when you do cast a red permanent spell, it deals 1 damage to any target. Okay, so another way to potentially punish 1 toughness creatures. Combined with first strike, you can maybe cast a red permanent before attacking to get past a 5 toughness creature. And yeah, just a 4 for first strike starting out is a great rate. So, another bomb level defiler. A dragon Whelp, reprinted, one of the few dragons in the set. 2 3 flyer is relatively large starting out, but we can also pump its power with the uh, fire breathing ability. Just have to be careful not to activate too many times and have to sacrifice it if we use it four or more times. But uh, if it means maybe attacking for lethal, then of course we don't care. So Dragon Whelp gets a B. The Elder Dragon War, another read ahead saga, this one a rare at 4 mana. First chapter deals 2 damage to each creature and each opponent. Great ability. And we mentioned go wide token decks being popular, so this is a great way to punish those. Chapter 2, discard any number of cards and then draw that many cards. Bit of card selection doesn't hurt. And finally make a 4-4 Rat Dragon creature token with flying. So this is a type of saga where I wouldn't mind going through all chapters to get the most value, but sometimes you're just desperate to get something on the board and you'll take the 4-4 Dragon right away, and that's fine. We get the flexibility of having all those different modes. So easily a bomb gets an A. Electrostatic Infantry, 2 mana, 1, 2, Dwarf, Wizard, and Uncommon. And yeah, this will fit quite nicely in your Blue Red uh, Spells deck, for instance, as it has Trample, and whenever we cast an instant or sorcery spell, put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on Electrostatic Infantry. So reminiscent of the 1-1 uh, one, one Dragon that uh, picked up plus 1 counters with Flying. This trades flying for trample and an extra point of toughness. So yeah, great card, especially alongside cheap instants that can maybe pump it and uh, surprise the opponent. So we'll give this a B. 
Fires of Victory is a tricky one. 2 mana, uncommon, instant in red. And then it deals damage to target creature or planeswalker equal to the number of cards in your hand. So in the early game this is great since you're likely holding a bunch of cards. So you can easily dispatch an opposing 2 or 3 drop. As we get to the late game and you start emptying your hands, it can maybe only deal 1 or 2 damage. But it also has kicker for 2 and a blue, in which case we draw a card. So that can also help deal an extra point of damage. If you know you're about to cast fires, you can hold lands in hand, of course. Yeah, even in the late game, this could be like 5 mana, draw card, deal 3 damage to a creature, which is still pretty decent. And uh, yeah, just a ton of flexibility here. So removal spell that draws a card is uh, what dreams are made out of. So we'll go with an optimistic B for fires of victory. Flowstone Infusion, 1 mana instant, says target creature gets plus 2, minus 2 until end of turn. So can be a 1 mana removal spell, can also be a 1 mana pump spell, depending on your needs. It's never going to be the most like efficient or powerful card, but uh, yeah, it's quite versatile. Can maybe pair well with some evasive creatures to get the last 2 points of damage in and act as a, a pseudo burn spell, but for the most part I think we're killing one or two toughness creatures from the opponent, or enabling a trade, although at that point we're kind of two for oneing ourselves a little bit, so not quite as good as shrinking power and toughness like we can with a black removal spell. So at the most gets a, a C for infusion. Flowstone Kavu, 3 mana, 2-3 Kavu at common with menace. This one, single red, gets plus one, minus one until end of turn. So pairs very well with Menace. Threat of Activation is also a big deal here. Can attack and if the opponent's controlling a couple, uh, let's say, 2-2 two -two creatures, they'll think twice about double blocking and trading after we pump the Kavu, and then we maybe just get two free damage in and cast something else without even activating it, and then potentially hits for four damage if uh, we can pump an opposed. So yeah, C plus for Kavu, like this a lot. Furious Bellow is a better version of Sure Strike, two mana instant speed pump spell, not only giving plus three power and first strike, but we also get to scry one, so a small upgrade there. And yeah, Sure Strike's always been one of my favorite types of combo tricks, can use it to push extra damage, and three power and first strike means we're often winning whatever trade is about to happen in the middle of combat. So if I were to give one of these two mana combat tricks a C+, this might be the one, but I'll still go with a C since there's always a diminishing return to having too many combat tricks if you run out of creatures. G2 Amplifier, two mana, one two human wizard at common, and whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell it gets plus two power until end of turn, can also kick it for two and a blue, at which point it's five mana, and then when it enters it can bounce an opposing creature back to hand. At 5 mana, kind of reminds you of the uh, G2 Journey Mage, I believe it was called in original Dominaria, in blue, which bounced a creature, although it could sometimes cost 4 mana, and that was a 3-2 by default. This is only a 3-2 if we cast an instant or sorcery, although if we cast multiple instants and sorceries it could be even more than 3 power. So it's about similar power level, also has the flexibility of casting it for 2 mana. So in a blue-red spells deck specifically, this is probably a C+. Outside of blue-red spells, I probably wouldn't play it. Goblin Picker, 2 mana, 2-2 two, two Goblin at common. Single red, tap it to discard a card and draw a card. Yeah, it's a 2-drop that has relevant late-game utility. And the name's also quite funny, maybe a reference to Goblin Piker, which was a 2 mana 2 1. This is a picker instead. A nice ability in the late game to get rid of lands you don't need and potentially find more action. And a 2 2 early is still totally fine. So C plus for picker. Hammerhand is a reprint. Target creature cannot block this turn. And our enchanted creature gets plus 1 plus 1 and has haste. So ideally you want to play this alongside a fresh creature so it can attack right away, 
and potentially deal a lot of surprise damage out of nowhere. Not only are you adding a hasty creature to the board, but you're also eliminating a blocker. So in an aggressive deck, this can seriously uh, deal a lot of damage. So always a card you need to respect. Um, that being said, I probably wouldn't want to play this in my average like red mid rangey deck. So you do need to be pretty committed to being the aggressive player. But yeah, in like a red-white or a uh, maybe even a red-black deck, this could be quite exciting. So we'll go with the C for Hammerhand. Hurler Cyclops, 5 mana, 5 for Cyclops at Uncommon. Can pay 1 mana to sacrifice another creature at any point to deal 1 damage to any target. So this is perfect in your red-black sacrifice decks. But uh, yeah, even by itself a 5-4 for 5 reasonable stats, and then you can maybe take out some 1-toughness creatures, sacrifice some tokens that you might have laying around, or sacrifice a creature that you put targeting with removal to still get a bit of value out of it, and it's very cheap to keep up the ability. You can chum block and sacrifice, so there's a lot of tricks you can pull off with the Cyclops. There is one common steel effect in red that we'll get to in a second, so, so that one we can also potentially pair with it to steal an opposing creature and then sack it for one mana. So another synergy to keep in mind. Give Cyclops a C+. Herloon Battle Him is a great removal spell. A three mana instant and uncommon, dealing four damage to a creature or planeswalker. Can also kick it for a single white, in which case we also gain four life. So kind of like your war leader's helix if you kick it, although it cannot go face is the one exception. Still a great removal spell, even in just a mono red deck. We'll give it a B. In a Thrall to the Pit, 4 mana sorcery, and this is the act of treason of the set. Gain control of an opposing creature, untap it, gains haste until end of turn, and then we have to give it back. But this can also be kicked for 2 in a black in which case that creature will be sacrificed at the beginning of the next end step. So then you don't even need to have a second combo piece to do the sacrificing, although it will come at a price of 7 mana total, which is pretty expensive. But uh, still give this a C, and ideally you can pair this with a cheaper sacrifice outlet, like the Cyclops we just discussed. Next we have another Planeswalker, Jaya, Fiery, Negotiator, 4 mana, 4 loyalty, 4 different abilities, plus 1 to make a 1-1 one, one red monk creature token with prowess, meaning whenever we cast an instant or sorcery it gets plus 1 plus 1 until end of turn, can minus 1 to exile the top 2 cards of our library, and then one of those we can play this turn, and then the minus 2 is the removal mode, saying choose target creature an opponent controls, and when we attack this turn, Jaya will deal damage to that creature equal to the number of attackers we have. And then a minus 8 ultimate, also a lot of fun if we can get to it, but uh, that's probably not going to happen very often. So yeah, Jaya seems quite awesome, especially in a deck that can enable prowess, so that has a lot of instants and sorceries. Also quite good in a go wide deck that can enable the minus 2 ability, so we don't need to necessarily make monk tokens first. So easily a bomb level card that can protect itself nicely by making creature tokens. Jaya's Fire Nado is a 5 mana sorcery, dealing 5 damage to a creature or planeswalker, and we get to scry one. So not bad for a common removal spell, a bit on the pricey side, so it's not gonna get the B grade that some of the more efficient removal spells got. Um, it's also a sorcery, so that also is a strike against it. Still a card you're probably fine to play one or two copies of as kind of a necessary evil to make sure you have a bit of interaction, but not a card I'm excited to pick up necessarily. So I'll give Fire Nado a C. This is the type of card I might have given a C plus in the past, but they've gotten a bit worse over time, I think. Keldon Flame Sage, 3 mana, 2 3, Human Shaman at rare, has Enlist. And when the Flame Sage attacks, look at the top X cards of your library, where X is the Flame Sage's power, and then you may exile an instant or sorcery with mana value X or less from among them, and put the rest on the bottom, and then cast the chosen card without paying its mana cost. 
Okay, so this can be a very big swing if you manage to hit a powerful instant or sorcery and cast it for free, maybe even clearing a path so that the opponents cannot trade for the Flame Sage. Problem is, if you miss, then it looks kind of bad as a kind of average and list creature. So, needs to be in the right deck for this to be worth it, but yeah, presumably blue-red spells or maybe a deck with a lot of other removal spells can make use of this. So we'll start out with a more conservative uh, C plus for Flame Sage. Keldon Strike Team, a 3 mana, 3-1 three Human Warrior at common. And as long as Strike Team entered the battlefield this turn, creatures you control have haste. So that includes itself. And we can also kick it for 1 and a white, in which case we get to make a pair of 1-1 one, one white soldier creature tokens. Okay, so that's a lot of value, 5 mana, a 3-1 and a pair of 1-1s. One they all have haste until end of turn. Will work very nicely in your red-white go-wide aggro decks. And even at 3 mana by itself, it's not bad if the opponent doesn't have a blocker back. So it can punish potential slower starts from the opponent if they miss their 2-drop, for instance. So yeah, C plus for Strike Team seems great. Lightning Strike is going to be red's best common. 2 mana, 3 damage at instant speed. Not much more you can ask of a, a card here. And overall, outside of some of the green creatures that we'll see, most of the cards we've seen die to lightning strike. So easily a B. And uh, I would probably rank it higher than the black 4 mana removal spell. That's unconditional. Just because of the efficiency, can also go face. So perfect in a blue-red spells deck. And also just a nice finisher for any red aggro deck, really. Marios Outrider, 5 mana, 4-4, four, four, Elf Archer at common with reach and domain, dealing damage to the opponent for each land type we control as it enters. Not the most you know, efficient rate if you're just playing a two-color aggro deck, but I could see this doing some work as a defensive creature in a domain deck where it just casually deals like 3 or 4 damage to the opponent when entering, and then you're happy enough trading it off for an opposing removal spell or a creature, and then hopefully take over in the late game. So a bit of a weird effect for a domain deck, since domain tends to be more controlling and doesn't necessarily care about damage, but it's incidental enough where like a 4-4 reach for 5 is not a disaster. So we'll give this a C, not a card you should take early, even in the domain deck, you can probably wheel this one but uh, could be a fine role player there. Molten Monstrosity, part of the common cycle that gets a discount. This is a 5-5 Hellion with Trample, costing X less, where X is the greatest power among creatures you control. Okay, so 8 mana starting out is pretty steep, but doesn't take much to control, let's say, a 3-powered creature, and then this turns into a 5-5 Trampler for 5, which is pretty normal, so we'll give this a C as well. Phoenix Chick is an interesting card, a 1-1 one, one flyer with haste at uncommon. Cannot block, so we're just turning it sideways, and at some points it may die, but when we attack with three or more creatures, we can pay double red and then return Phoenix Chick from our graveyard to the battlefield tapped and attacking with an additional counter on it. So we'll come back with a vengeance and start hitting the opponent for two. So especially in like a blue-red aggro spells deck or a red-white go-white token deck that can easily bring it back. This seems like a nice addition and we'll uh, give it a C+. Plus. But uh, not gonna want this in your domain control or mid-range decks, can tell you that much. Randa's Firebrand, 2 mana, 3-1 human warrior at rare. Makes it difficult for the opponent to block because as it attacks, a creature defending player controls with power less than the Firebrand's power cannot block this turn. So can prevent two powered creatures from blocking early, which is quite useful to get in some early hits. And then later in the game with Domain, we can give it plus two plus two until end of turn. And it costs six mana, but gets a one mana discount for each basic land type we control. So if we're monocolored, it's five mana, but easily four mana in a two-color deck and uh, can potentially even get cheaper in a more dedicated domain deck. 
Although probably at its best in kind of a more mid-rangey red-green domain deck is my guess, where we can still activate it for four mana and turn it into a 5-3, which will make blocks pretty difficult. So this card seems great, easily a B. Rundvelt Hordemaster, part of the rare Lord cycle that hasn't been too amazing so far, a bit hit or miss. And this is definitely on the miss side of the spectrum, as there's almost no goblins in the set. A 1-1 one, one pumping all goblins, and when it dies, or another goblin dies, we can exile the top card of our library. If it's a goblin card, we may cast that card until the end of our next turn. So might be great in Constructed, but for Limited this is probably just an F, because there's only a handful of goblins. Shivan Devastator X and a red for a 0-0 Dragon Hydra at Mythic, has Flying and Haste, and enters a battlefield with X plus 1 plus 1 counters on it. Okay, so once you get past X equals maybe 2 or 3, you start getting to some very exciting territory for the Devastator. So I imagine this is going to be at its best in like a red-green kind of ramp strategy, where you can uh, sink more mana into the X, but Devastator is going to be amazing in any red deck really. So it doesn't take much work, easy first pick, bomb level card, gets an A. Smash to Dust, I think is more of a sideboard card. A two mana sorcery at common can destroy an artifact, a creature with defender, or it can deal one damage to each creature your opponents control. That last mode is probably the most promising to potentially main deck, as it can punish the go wide token decks. But even then, there's only so many 1-1 tokens this can uh, potentially take out, only so many decks playing the token strategy. So, very good sideboard card, I would hesitate to main deck it, so we'll give it a D. Sprouting Goblin is pretty exciting, a 2-mana 2-2 two -two at Uncommon. But we can also kick it for a single green, in which case when it enters we can search our library for a land card with a basic land type which you might think is only basic lands, but as we mentioned at the very start of the stream here, there's also a cycle of common dual lands with the uh, basic land types, so we can also search those up, including, let's say, we could even get a, a blue-white dual land, for instance, and then all of a sudden our domain count is up to four, and uh, put that land into our hand, and then shuffle, and then we can also pay a red, tap, and sacrifice a land to draw a card. So in the late game we can get rid of some lands for more action. So this card's great, if we can kick it. 2-mana um, 2-2 two -two goblin, not too exciting, but if we kick it, it kind of looks more like a borderland ranger uh, that finds a land when it enters, which is awesome. Can fix our mana, great in a domain deck, which is typically base green, maybe base red green. So yeah, C plus at the very least for Sprouting Goblin, but uh, I think might even bump it up to a B for the more dedicated domain decks. And Squee is back, now a dubious monarch. 3 mana, 2-2 two -two legendary Goblin Noble at rare, has haste, so quite aggressive, and when it attacks you get to make a 1-1 red Goblin creature token that's tapped and attacking. So reminiscent of maybe a Legion war boss. And then we can even recur Squee from the graveyard by paying 4 mana and exiling 4 other cards from our graveyard rather than paying its mana cost. So yeah, great card if we can play turn 3 and start attacking, especially if the 1-1 one -one token gets to connect. We'll probably be at its best in a red-white go-wide token deck and uh, easily deserving of a B. Temporal Firestorm, a 5 mana rare sweeper at sorcery speed dealing uh, 5 damage to each creature and each planeswalker, but we can also kick it for either 1 and a white and or 1 and a blue, and for each time it was kicked we can phase out a creature or planeswalker we control. So we can potentially save our two most valuable uh, permanents if we cast this for what would be 9 mana, but more likely for 7 mana save one creature and then destroy the rest, but even at just 5 mana, dealing 5 damage to everything, it's awesome to have access to a sweeper and be able to decide when to pull the trigger, whereas the opponent doesn't necessarily get to play around it. 
and uh, sweepers like this often deserving of an A as they're very impactful in a game of limited. Thrill of Possibility, reprint it, 2 mana instance, add common as an additional cost, discard a card to draw 2. So nice instance, plays well in the blue-red spells decks as another cantrip, can maybe keep it up alongside a counter spell, and uh, also maybe has a bit of synergy with discarding uh, creatures, can maybe enable the leech or the other uh, black common creature that gets discounts for having creatures in the graveyard. So it can maybe set up some neat uh, reanimation strategies as well in red-black. But uh, yeah, overall, fine, playable. I think still just a C-level card. Not every deck's going to want it, but a uh, solid role player in uh, certain decks. And then we've got Twinferno, a split card of either a comma trick, giving a creature double strike until end of turn, or we can copy the next instant or sorcery spell we would play this turn. So very different modes, uh, two mana uncommon. So giving double strike for two mana, something we've seen before, can be very impactful, especially more aggressive decks. And I'm also thinking of potentially pairing this with some of the Enlist creatures, especially the Trampling one, the uh, Coalition Warbrute comes to mind. Could definitely benefit from double strike after we maybe enlist another high powered creature alongside it. But this could also be totally fine in a creature light deck that just wants to copy an instant or sorcery. Copying a lightning strike seems like a, a nice deal and only four mana total, so quite achievable. So the flexibility here, I think, bumps it up to a C. Vyashino Branch Rider, one mana for a 1 1. And for 2 and a red, we can give it plus 2 plus 0 until end of turn. Reminiscent of kind of the weasel back from Throne of Eldraine, but we can also kick this for 2 and a green, in which case it enters with 2 plus 1 plus 1 counters on it. So then it's a 4 mana, 3-3, three, three, with potentially being able to pump its power even more. So as a 1-1, one, one, a bit underwhelming since it's kind of expensive to pump and the opponent can still easily trade their 2-drop with it. And uh, so let's say you attack into a 2-2, you're forced to pump, you spent more mana than the opponent spent on their 2-drop, and uh, you're kind of down on the exchange. And even if you kick it, it's not the most efficient rate. So not a huge fan of the Branch Rider. I think this one's probably better off staying in the sideboard. I'll give it a D but sometimes I could see a very aggressive deck just wanting more 1-drops, as it does also have haste, which is, I guess, an important detail to mention. Warhost's Frenzy, 3 mana instant at uncommon, and it's basically a trumpet blast saying creatures you control get plus 2 plus 0 until end of turn, but we can also kick it for single black, in which case whenever a creature we control dies this turn, draw a card. Okay, so awesome as a pump effect in your black-red aggressive decks. Opponent's gonna line up some blocks, potentially even expecting a pump spell, but either they take a ton of damage or they try and trade their creatures, in which case we're just gonna replace all the creatures that died with an additional card, so it's gonna be easier to get back on the board. So yeah, Frenzy seems awesome for a red-black deck, even in, let's say, a red-white tokens deck, while probably not as good as the double white 4 mana charge that gives plus 2 plus 1, it's still serviceable. So yeah, easily a C plus for Frenzy. Yavimaya's Steel Crusher, 2 mana, 2-2 two, two, Ape Warrior at common with Enlist, but can also be sacrificed for 1 mana to take out an artifact. Not that many artifacts in the set to begin with, 2-2 two, two Enlist, is fine, but not exciting, still trades for opposing 2-drops, so kind of an unexciting 2-drop, gets a C at most. And Yotia Declares War is a funny one, a 2-mana read ahead saga at uncommon. Chapter 1 makes an ornithopter, chapter 2 lets us tap any number of untapped artifacts we control to deal that much damage to a creature or planeswalker. So assuming we only control an Ornithopter, we can deal 1 damage somewhere. And then finally we can transform one of our artifacts into a 4-4 until end of turn. Okay, so we can deal 4 damage to the opponent basically, 
and then we'll have a leftover Ornithopter. So kind of a strange card in a set that doesn't have a ton of artifact synergy, but I think it does enough, all things considered, that I'm willing to give it a C. You can also maybe pump the Ornithopter later with one of your various pump spells in red-white, for instance, so it can still maybe contribute to some extra damage. So time to look at green, our last monocolor, and then we still have lands and artifacts left, but those shouldn't take too long. So our first green card is a Barkweave Crusher, 4 mana, 2-5, Elemental Warrior at common with Enlist. So kind of a strange set of uh, power and toughness on an Enlist creature. Not too excited about it, to be honest. Seems like we're better off staying back with the Crusher instead of attacking with it. I think there's better ways to spend 4 mana, especially in green. So gets a C at most, but honestly could be as low as a D. Bite down, on the other hand, one of the more exciting commons in green. An instance saying target creature you control deals damage equal to its power to target creature or planeswalker you don't control. So known as a bite effect and at instant speed even. Easily gets a B. Great card. Bog Badger. 3 mana, 3-3 three, three Badger at common. So already reasonable stats, but can also be kicked for one black. In which case, when it enters, creatures you control gain menace until end of turn. So nice little upside that can help you get in some damage. We'll give it a C+. Broken Wings, 3 mana instant at common. Known sideboard card to take out artifacts, enchantments, or flyers. Give it a D. Colossal Growth, 2 mana pump spell. Pumping for 3, so essentially a giant growth, but can also be kicked, so it's going to be 3 mana total, including a red and a green, in which case it's plus 4, plus 4, trample, and haste. Don't see us necessarily leveraging the haste very often, since that means we would need to cast another creature alongside it, but yeah, could certainly catch the opponent off guard if we can all of a sudden haste and plus 4 and trample out of nowhere. Uh, still, Probably not more than a C for this type of pump spell, but uh, yeah, not bad to have access to in a creature-heavy deck. A Deathbloom Gardener, a 3-mana 1-1 one, one Elf Druid at common with Death Touch that can tap to add 1 mana of any color. So a 1-1 one, one mana creature that makes 1 mana of any color is great, and then a 1-1 one, one Death Touch means even in the late game this is still useful as it can hold off large attackers on the ground. Now I will say, adding one mana of any color, while great for helping you with certain kicker costs, it does not increase your basic land count for domain, so that's one potential issue of uh, playing this versus a spell that puts an extra land in play, but again a 1-1 death touch is certainly a relevant card, so C plus for the Gardener. Defiler of Vigor. I think it's finally time to dish out an S grade here. A 5 mana 6 6 Frexen Worm rare with trample and has the same Frexen mana ability, giving us a 1 mana discount at the cost of 2 life for green permanent spells. And then whenever we cast a green permanent spell, put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on each creature you control. Especially if we get to untap with a Defiler, this can get out of hand very quickly. But best case scenario, we can maybe wait until like 6 mana to play this and a random green 2-drop immediately pump the team. And then even if the opponent does have one of the few answers to Defiler, we still got a bit of an advantage out of it. So it's not really an S-tier level card in the sense that it's difficult to answer, but it's an S-tier in the sense that if you just get to untap with it once, it's probably game over. And it's a 6-6 trample as a fail case, which is still great for 5 mana. So yeah, I think I'm willing to go up to an S for this. Just that good. Next is Elfheim Worm, 5 mana, 5-4 five, Worm with Vigilance and Trample. Definitely some relevant keywords on a relatively large creature. We'll give it a C+. We'll play well with Pump Spells. Trample means it won't get chum blocked easily by random tokens, which is a potential concern otherwise. Elvish Hydromancer, 3 mana, 3-2 three, Elf Wizard at Uncommon. 
and it has a pretty neat kicker ability for three and a blue, so seven mana total, in which case when it enters the battlefield, if it was kicked, create a token that's a copy of target creature you control. So even on an empty board, at the very least, we can copy itself, but ideally we copy something more exciting, and the fail case is still a three mana three two. So yeah, there's a lot to like about this, especially in your blue-green ramp domain decks, but can easily splash for the blue kicker as well. So we'll give it a B. Floriferous Vine Wall, 2 mana, 0 2 plant wall with defender at common. So it can maybe contribute to your defender count for some of those synergies. Although, as we've discussed, they're mostly in Esper colors. So I think this is the only green defender. So it may not be worth splashing for it necessarily. Either way, an 0 2 that when it enters the battlefield lets you look at the top 6 cards of your library reveal a land card from among them and put it into your hand. So it can help you maybe fix your mana in your domain decks if you don't have any other 2-drops. It's a nice blocker that can maybe soak up a big attack at some point. So a fine creature and kind of curve filler, and the domain decks will probably value it pretty highly to help complete their different uh, basic land types, but I'll give it a C. Gaia's Might, a 1 mana instant at common with domain, giving plus 1 plus 1 for each basic land type we control. It's so kind of a weird effect since I think most of the domain decks are looking to play more controlling, ramp game plan, so they wouldn't necessarily be interested in a pump spell, uh, especially since they're often going to be on the back foot, and then if their one creature that they're trying to pump gets removed by some effect, they're quickly going to fall behind and uh, regret holding a pump spell instead of something else. That being said, it could be plus 5 for 1 mana, which is a great rate, of course. Just I think it's going to be a little awkward for most of the domain decks. Maybe like a red-green, more aggressive domain deck that can get up to 3 or 4 basic line types is happy to have it. But uh, in a two-color deck, it's only plus two, plus two for one mana, which is not exciting. So I'm going to start out with a D for Might, but I'll be happily uh, proven wrong and hopefully can see the full plus five, plus five in action at some point. Herd Migration, seven mana, rare sorcery. And we can basically channel it. It's not really channel, but for one and a green, we can discard it from our hand to search our library for a basic land card, reveal it, put it into our hand, and we also gain 3 life. Or we can cast the 7 mana sorcery, creating a 3-3 three, three green beast creature token for each basic land type we control. So yeah, if you are a dedicated domain deck, you'll appreciate both halves of this card. So nice first pick potentially to set you up for the domain deck, as both an enabler and a payoff card, and gets a B. Happy if this makes at least three beasts, but ideally aim for four. Hexbane Turtus is a three mana, three two turtle at common with ward two and enlist. Not the biggest fan of enlist creatures without evasion, especially if you only have two toughness. It's just gonna end up trading for a random two drop. So, yeah, not super interested in the Turtus especially since there's no like auras or equipment really to potentially enhance it. Not too many plus one counters either. So give this either a C or maybe even a D. I'll go with a C. Still a three to at the end of the day. Leaf crowned visionary, double green for a one one elf druid at rare, part of that cycle of rares, giving other elves we control plus one plus one. So yeah, for a deck maybe has like four or five elves, this may be worth it since it doesn't take many of those to kind of pay for the visionary by drawing extra cards. So the payoff here is definitely there, but I wouldn't first pick this, but if I'm past it pretty late and I happen to have a couple elves, I might give it a shot. So I'll give it a C. And of course a great card for Constructed. Linebreaker Beloth. 5 mana, 4 5, beast at uncommon, and it has enlist, and there's more, it cannot be blocked by creatures with power 2 or less. So there's my evasive ability that I was waiting for. So yeah, now I'm a lot more interested in this enlist creature than I was before, 
having an ability to make it harder to block or double block means we're more likely to actually connect with all the extra power we sink into it. So happy enough giving this a B. I think this will be a nice finisher for some green decks. Lenore, a green widow, 3 mana, 4, 3, spider at rare with reach and trample. So great stats starting out. But there's more. Domain for 7 and a green. Let's us return the green widow from our graveyard to the battlefield tapped. And we get a 1 mana discount for each basic land type we control. So we can easily activate this for like 5 or 6 mana. And then if the widow would die, it gets exiled instead, so we can only bring it back once really. Still seems like a great card, especially at 3 mana, just efficient and can stop opposing flyers, beats down pretty hard, and then late game, randomly generate more value. I think this is approaching bomb territory. Lenor Loam Speaker, 2 mana, 1 3, add rare, an elf druid that can tap to add 1 mana of any color, so a nice mana fixer. But we can also, in the late game, potentially turn some of our lands into a 3 3 elemental creature with haste until end of turn. Can only be activated as a sorcery, so won't be able to use it on defense. But having a mana creature that's in the late game still relevant by making 3 3s out of our lands seems great. So easily a B for Loam Speaker. Lenor Stalker, 1 mana, 1-1 one, one Elf Warrior at common, saying whenever another creature enters the battlefield under your control, it gets plus 1 plus 0 until end of turn. So this will be at its best in a green-white tokens deck, where you can make lots of creatures to pump up Stalker even more than once each turn. It is a card that can drop off in power pretty quickly if you can't consistently keep making more creatures, so that's kind of the risk of including this 1-drop. But if your deck is aggressive enough and uh, can curve out. This can easily contribute to a lot of damage. So we'll start out with a conservative C grade, but just be aware of uh, any green-white decks being able to leverage this. Magnigoth Sentry, 4 mana, 4-4 four, four, Tree Folk with a Reach at common. Pretty vanilla, but nothing wrong with it. Gets a C. Mossbeard Ancient, 7 mana, 7-7 seven, seven Tree Folk at Uncommon with a Trample, and when it enters, you gain 5 life. That's a lot of life, and a 7-7 seven, seven Trample doesn't mess around. Give this a B, nice payoff for ramping in your blue-green decks especially. Nishoba Brawler, 2 mana, star, 3, so power equal to the number of basic land types among lands we control thanks to Domain, and it has Trample. So not a bad 2-mana uncommon cat warrior, so potential payoff for the domain deck. Now, would I take this early and build a domain deck around it? Eh, probably not, but if I get past this somewhere in the middle of the pack, then maybe it's an incentive to jump into the domain deck, probably starting out either uh, green-white or green-red, and then potentially expanding into more colors afterwards. So overall grade, C+. Quirion Beast Caller, 2 mana, 2-2 two, two Dryad Warrior at rare, saying whenever we cast a creature spell, put a plus 1 counter on it, and when it dies, we can distribute those counters among any number of target creatures we control. So, yeah, totally fine 2-drop, especially if we can play it early and steadily keep adding more counters onto it. Seems like a great uh, creature, so we'll give it a B. Scout the Wilderness, 3 mana sorcery, at common. Let's us search our library for a basic land card, put it on the battlefield tapped. So a nice domain enabler. And if we pay the additional kicker of 1 and a white, we get to make 2 1-1 one, one white soldier creature tokens. They could have easily stopped at 1 token, but making 2 turns this into a very interesting ramp spell that will fit perfectly in the green-white domain decks, but pretty much any domain deck is happy to make some tokens to buy time against other aggressive decks, and then uh, helping us ramp towards bigger and better things. So C plus for Scout. Silverback Elder, 5 mana, 5-7 five, Ape Shaman at Mythic, saying whenever we cast a creature spell, choose one between often we're probably just going to gain 4 life, 
or destroy an artifact or enchantment if there's one of those around, or we can look at the top five cards of our library to put a land from among them onto the battlefield tapped and the rest on the bottom. So finding more lands I guess could be relevant if we've got more expensive cards in hand, but once we're at five we probably don't need too many more. But gaining four life is useful in a racing situation, and a 5-7 also just beats down very hard. So not the most exciting mythic I've ever seen, but I think it's still bomb worthy, as it makes it very difficult to race for the opponent. Slimefoot's Survey, 5 mana, uncommon sorcery, with a domain, and this is a pretty interesting one, as it's both an enabler and a payoff all in one. We can search our library for up to two land cards that each have a basic land type, so it doesn't even have to be a basic land necessarily. Put them on the battlefield tapped, and then shuffle, then we can look at the top X cards of our library, where X is the number of basic land types among lands we control. Put one of them on top of our library, and the rest on the bottom. So this can easily enable the full domain for us if we have enough of the common dual lands with different basic land types. If we, let's say, have a, a red-white land and a blue-black one, all of a sudden we've got full domain, and we also get to look at the top five to dig for another payoff card. So this seems awesome, assuming you can get the right lands to go with it, and of course are pretty dedicated to the domain archetype. Still always survey a C+. Not every green deck is necessarily going to want it, but the dedicated domain decks will be happy to pick this up and even take it early if they have other reasons to be in the domain deck. We've got a reprint of Snare Spinner, 2 mana, 1, 3, Spider at common with reach. If it blocks a creature with flying, it gets 2 additional power until end of turn. So a great defensive creature if you're afraid of flying creatures. And uh, yeah, happens to do a very good job in War of the Spark, I believe and uh, could potentially do it here as well. Haven't noticed an incredible number of flying creatures, some of them also big enough to attack past a 3 power snare spinner, so I don't think this is going to be the amazing card it was in War of the Spark, but still at the very least a C. Strength of the Coalition, single green instant at uncommon, giving plus 2 plus 2 until end of turn. Not very exciting, but there's more. If we kick it for 2 and a white, we can put a plus one plus one counter on each creature we control. So now one creature is getting three additional power and toughness, and the rest is still also getting a plus one counter. So awesome card in your green-white tokens deck. Have the versatility of a one mana plus two plus two, but hoping to save enough mana for the kicker mode, at which point I think this might get up to the B range here. Sunbathing Rootwalla, 2 mana, Lizard at common, it's a 2-2, and this is a nice domain payoff card, although you can easily play it outside of domain decks. For 4 mana, until end of turn, Rootwalla gets plus 1 plus 1 for each basic land type you control, can only be activated once each turn, but can be activated at instant speed, so threat of activation also plays a role here, and even in a 2 color deck it's plus 2 plus 2, which starts adding up, but uh, yeah, in a dedicated domain deck, Plus 5 plus 5 is a, a nice payoff for getting those land types in play, while still having an early creature to trade off if necessary. So C plus for Rootwalla. Tailswipe is one of the fight spells I mentioned earlier. A 1 mana uncommon instant, choosing target creature we control and target creature we don't control. And if we cast it during our main phase, our creature also gets a plus one plus one bonus until end of turn, and then those creatures fight. So we can use it at instant speed, but preferably if we want to get the plus one plus one, it's going to be used in our main phase. And uh, yeah, not a bad little uh, fight spell. Getting that additional plus one makes a big difference. We'll give Tailswipe a B, similar to Bite Down. I think Bite Down might actually be the better of the two, but uh, this still nice at one mana. Next we have Territorial Amaro, 5 mana, star star, power and toughness equal to twice the number of basic lands we control, or basic land types I should say, because of course there's the dual lands as well that still count. In a two color deck, not a card you're particularly interested in, as it's only a 4-4, but in a domain deck can grow up to a 10-10 for 5 mana, so that's definitely worth it. So overall great, I'll go with C+. 
a card that if I see it's somewhere in the middle of the pack, I might be incentivized to commit to the domain deck. Threats undetected, 3 mana, a rare sorcery, letting us search our library for up to 4 creature cards with different powers and reveal them. Opponent gets to choose 2 of those cards that we get to put in our hand. Rest goes back in our library. Okay, so 3 mana, essentially draw 2 cards, but the opponent gets to choose, although we still have some agency over which creatures our opponent gets to uh, pick. So... Overall still seems fine, just keep an eye out for having a wide range of uh, powers so you always have a nice split to search up. Would be awkward if you can only search three creatures and you only get one of them. So Threats Undetected, C+, not a bad card draw effect for a green deck. Next is Urborg, a Lurgoyf, two mana for a creature with... One extra toughness, and then power and toughness equal to the number of creatures in our graveyard. Can be kicked for either a blue and or a black, and then we get to mill three cards for each time it was kicked. So it can potentially mill six if we cast it for four mana, but even just playing it for two mana it will gradually grow over time. And uh, in the Sultai colors we've seen a few other self-mill cards that will help grow Lurgoyf. So, yeah, seems like a decent card, but also not the type of card I'm super ecstatic to first pick. But, uh, yeah, C plus for Lurgoyf. Vineshaper Prodigy, 2 mana, 2-2 two, two Elf Druid at common. So already a fine 2-drop if needed, but can also be kicked for 1 and a blue, in which case when it enters, we can look at the top 3 cards of our library, put one of them into our hand, and the rest on the bottom. So 4 mana, 2-2, two, two, that not only draws a card, but draws a card out of the top 3 is pretty great. Now, we do have to be 2 colors for this kicker to work. So let's say it's early in the draft and I take this. It's not quite as flexible as, let's say, a card like Frexen Rager that I can play in any black deck. This needs to specifically go in a green deck that's capable of making some blue mana to get the benefit from kicker. So it's not... A flexible pick during the draft, but it is a flexible card in your deck, assuming you have both blue and green mana. So I'm gonna take that into account for the overall grade. If the kicker was one and a green, I think I might be willing to give this like a B grade. As is, I think it's a high C plus, but blue green's gonna be very happy to have access to a two drop that's still very relevant in the late game. Weather Seed Treaty, 3 mana, uncommon, read ahead saga. First chapter lets us search for a basic land card, so this specifically calls for basic land and not any land. Put it on the battlefield tapped. Second chapter makes a 1 1 token, so it can maybe pair with a black green rare that cares about sapperling. And finally, domain, a creature we control, gets plus x plus x and Trample until end of turn, where X is the number of basic land types among lands we control. So a great payoff in a domain deck, both an enabler and a payoff all in one, and we can pump the 1-1 token we generated on chapter 2. So yeah, very fun card for any domain deck, and willing to give it a B. Then we've got the World Spell, 7 mana, Mythic Rare, Enchantment Saga. First two chapters, we get to look at the top seven cards of our library to reveal a non-saga permanent from among them, put it into our hand. Final chapter, put up to two non-saga permanent cards from your hand onto the battlefield. So this is a, a nice source of uh, card and mana advantage, potentially, if you can cheat some expensive things into play. But even just the first two chapters of uh, digging very deep for any of your best creatures, to put in hand seems quite awesome. So even without a third chapter, this card would be totally fine. A um, bit expensive, of course, at seven mana, so I don't think I can quite give it an A, but given how deep it looks for author powerful cards, I think I'm willing to give it a B if you get to seven mana. This is very likely to win you the game. Then Yavimaya Iconoclasts, a two mana, three two elf at uncommon, has Trample, so already 3-2 Trampler for 2 is a pretty great rate. 
and there's more for just a single red mana we can kick it at which point it enters with an additional plus one plus one and haste until end of turn so a three mana four three haste trample that hits very hard and then you still have a three two trample left over probably have some constructed applications even and I like a B for the Iconoclast. And then Yavimaya Sojourner, part of the cycle of creatures that get a discount. This is a whopping 8 mana without any discounts, but basically costs 7 if you're mono green, as you get a 1 mana discount for each basic land type among lands you control. I guess outside of limiteds you could technically get to 8 mana without having any basic land types if you have enough fancy non-basic lands, but uh, for most intents and purposes a 4-6 in a two-color deck we can cast it for six mana. That's not what we're aiming for, we're trying to get maybe four or five basic land types, at which point this becomes a pretty appealing card to include, but as I uh, rated these other cards as part of the cycle, I'll give this a C as well. And then a Tear Asunder, 2 mana, uncommon instant, exiling an artifact or enchantment. So disenchant, not too exciting, but there's more. We can kick it for 1 on a black, at which point we can exile any target a non-land permanent instead. Okay, so it's 4 mana, deal with anything. You've got my attention, so in black, green specifically, this is awesome, easily a B. Outside of black, green, I wouldn't include it unless I've got some way to maybe splash black. Okay, so now it's time for artifacts and lands to close out this set review. And I guess there's one colorless card in the set as well, which is Karn Living Legacy. Four mana, four loyalty, legendary planeswalker. Plus one lets you create a tapped power stone token. It's a pretty weird token, can make colorless mana, but we can not spend it on non-artifact spells. So we cannot use it to cast a regular creature, but we can use it on, I guess, abilities. So there are still more things than just artifacts we can spend the mana on, but Kicker, for instance, is not one of them since it's still part of the cost of casting a creature spell. Pretty limited to what you can do with it, it's mainly, I guess, artifacts and abilities. Then the minus one is probably what we're most interested in with Karn, letting us pay any amount of mana. We can even just pay one mana. Look at that many cards from the top of our library and put one of those cards into our hand. So if we pay one, it's basically just drawing a card. If we have more mana available, we can dig a bit deeper and provide a bit of extra card advantage. But if we play this on curve, we might only have one mana to spare to use the minus one. And then the minus seven also makes a fun emblem that pairs with the power stone tokens. But as I mentioned earlier, there's not a ton of artifacts in this set, so power stone tokens are not very useful, at least in limited. So overall, Karn leaves a lot to be desired. Still potentially a card draw engine with a minus one, which, you know, if the format ends up being grindy enough, I could see being useful. But I'm still not excited about the card in general, so... Give Karn a C. Next is our first artifact, Automatic Librarian. 3 mana, 3-2 three, artifact creature construct at common. When it enters the battlefield, scry 2. We've seen a very similar card in blue that uh, cares about domain. This just lets you scry 2, but it's easier to cast, can play it in any deck. So this might be a, a type of card that a domain deck will appreciate, as you can cast it no matter your mana situation. So if you're struggling with a lot of different colors, then uh, this can also be a reliable 3-drop for you that scries to maybe set up some of your other domain synergies. Not an exciting card, but Scry 2 is pretty relevant, so happy giving it a C still. Next is the Golden Argosi. 4 mana, 3-6 legendary artifact vehicle at rare, one of the few vehicles in the set. And crew cost is only one, so very easy to turn into a creature. And whenever it attacks, we exile each creature that crewed it this turn. And as you'll remember, we can kind of over crew, so we can tap as many creatures as we want to help crew the vehicle. And then uh, we can basically flicker those creatures as they'll return to the battlefield tapped 
under their owner's control at the beginning of the next end step. Entering tapped does make a big difference as well, so have to be a bit careful, but uh, great alongside any ETB effects, as we can potentially re-trigger those, as long as we can keep attacking with our 3-6, but at 6 toughness it's pretty likely to get a few attacks in and survive. If I don't have any ETB effects, it's not particularly exciting, but uh, assuming I've got a couple of them, then this goes up in value, and overall rating, I think I'll end up giving it a C+. Heroes Heirloom, one of the few equipment in the set, 2 mana, uncommon, equips for 2 mana, giving plus 2 plus 1, and as long as the equipped creature is a legendary, it has Trample and Haste. Now Haste can only be so relevant when it costs 2 mana to equip, which means you're unlikely to cast a very expensive creature and then still have the mana to equip for 2 and give haste, but in the late game could be useful to maybe present some uh, attackers out of nowhere. Plus 2 plus 1 for a 4 mana investment is eh, not the best return, but only 2 mana afterwards to equip is not the worst, so you can maybe attack with an equipped creature and then move it back on defense if you have the mana for it. So yeah, it's not a bad equipment, kind of on the pricey side maybe, and uh, only at its best if you have enough legendaries to go with it. So not super excited about Heirloom in general, and uh, end up giving it a C. Next up, we have Inscribed Tablet, a one mana uncommon artifact. And for one mana, we can tap and sacrifice it, Reveal the top 5 cards of our library, putting a land from among them into our hand and the rest on the bottom. And if we didn't find a land that way, we get to draw a card instead. So at least there's no disaster scenario where there's no land on top and it completely misses, we at least get to draw. Could be fine in a domain deck and since it's colorless we can easily play and activate it early, no matter which lands we have. Outside of a domain deck, not particularly exciting, so I'll give it a C. Jodas Codex, 5 mana, uncommon artifact, kind of pricey, and we have to pay even more mana to activate it. 5 mana to tap and draw a card, but we get a 1 mana discount for each basic land type among lands we control. Okay, so not gonna be interested in this outside of a dedicated domain deck. If it's 5 mana to play and in a 2 color deck 3 to activate, that feels way too slow. If it's 0 mana to activate, you maybe have my attention, assuming your deck has enough early interaction so you don't get run over. So yeah, not a card most decks should prioritize and the domain decks can probably pick it up pretty late. So I'll give it a D, but in a very dedicated domain deck I might be tempted to try it out. Karn's Silex, 3 mana Mythic Rare Legendary Artifact, enters the battlefield tapped, saying players cannot pay life to cast spells or activate abilities that aren't mana abilities. So yeah, it can maybe be relevant against a completed Planeswalker for instance. And then we can pay X, tap it, and exile the Silex to destroy each non-land permanent with mana value X or less. Can only be used as a sorcery. Yeah, so can blow up the board pretty much whenever we want. The opponent will get a warning beforehand since it enters tapped, so we can sacrifice it right away. But uh, still a sweeper that you can control and leave in play for as long as you want, and then blow it up whenever needed. Still, I think, a bomb level card. Maybe not quite as good as your typical sweepers, but uh, the fact that you can play it in any deck means it's a nice early pick since it can slot into any strategy. Next is Meteorite, reprinted, 5 mana, common artifact, when it enters deals 2 damage to any target, and then taps to add 1 mana of any color. Now my one problem with Meteorite and some of these mana fixers is that they don't enable domain for you, so a deck where you might want this sort of ability is a domain deck that's interested in ramping, casting big expensive spells, but then it's not helping you with domain, so it's a little awkward. Uh, which makes me less interested than I would be otherwise, but uh, it still can recognize its potential in a deck trying to ramp, as it also offers a bit of interaction in the meantime. So I'll give it a C, but might end up closer to a D in practice. 
Then Relic of Legends, a 3 mana uncommon artifact, tapping for 1 mana of any color. And we can tap an untapped legendary creature we control at any point to add 1 mana of any color. So besides some obvious constructed applications in your uh, Kinon decks alongside Paradox Engine, this might also have a bit of potential in Limited, as there are quite a few legendary creatures out there, especially decks that also can uh, appreciate a bit of ramp. So we're still probably mostly looking at the green decks. But uh, yeah, this has quite a bit of potential. Three mana is pretty cheap and uh, can potentially ramp for two or three if we have the right legendaries to support it. This might get a C+. Then we've got the Salvaged Mana Worker, 2 mana, 1-3, Artifact Creature Construct at common. Can pay 1 mana to add 1 mana of any color, can only activate it once each turn. So it doesn't actually cost us any mana to activate this. Sometimes you'll see you have to pay 2 mana to make 1 mana of any color. This is essentially filtering mana for free, stapled onto a 1-3 creature, which, you know, is not too exciting in a format with a list especially. But against some 1-1 tokens, it can maybe soak up some uh, damage early. And then this could be a great way to enable some off-color kicker abilities. Let's say you opened the uh, White Angel that has the red and black kicker abilities. Maybe this is a way to get access to the third color without sacrificing too much in the mana base. So I can definitely see the Mana Worker coming in handy. It does not enable domain, just fixes your mana. So another card that you probably don't necessarily want in your domain deck. But uh, yeah, I can see its use if you're trying to enable some off-color kicker abilities. So it seems playable. We'll give it a, a C overall. Shield Wall Sentinel, 4 mana, 1-3. Artifact Creature Golem at common with Defender. And this can help you find another Defender when it enters the battlefield. You can search our library for one and put it in hand. So yeah, if there's ever a defender deck, this is probably part of it. Can help you find your payoffs in blue, black, and white mostly. And uh, a one three four four is not exciting, so we're definitely giving up a bit of value uh, by playing this. But hopefully we can make up for it by grabbing a nice defender along the way. So this is probably a D overall, but hopefully that means that uh, decks that actually want it and need it will get access to it late. Timeless Lotus, 5 mana, a legendary artifact and mythic, enters battlefield tapped, taps for 1 mana of any color. Yeah, once again, doesn't help with domain, does make a lot of mana, so I guess it helps for kicker and maybe like a weird multicolor control deck. Still feels pretty narrow, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it for your average limited deck, but uh, maybe more experienced drafters can figure out a way to fully leverage this paired with a lot of card draw and off-color kicker abilities. But uh, again, not a super high pick, probably a C or a D. Vanquisher's Axe, another one of the equipments. One mana to play, two mana to equip, giving two additional power at common. So very similar to the previous equipment we've seen. About the same in power level, you give up one extra point of toughness, but it's one cheaper to play. So give that a C, give this a C as well. Walking Bulwark, 1 mana, 3 Artifact Creature Golem at uncommon with Defender. And for 2 mana, until end of turn, a creature with Defender gains haste and can attack as if it didn't have Defender and deal damage equal to its toughness rather than its power. So this is another one of the Defender payoff cards, potentially. A 1 mana, 3 so can potentially hit for 3, although it's going to be a pretty sizable mana investment to do it over and over again. So yeah, fine in the defender decks. Whether or not the defender deck is going to end up being a real thing uh, remains to be seen, but I'm kind of skeptical for now. So we'll give this a C, and uh, hopefully the deck uh, ends up being a real contender in the format. Weather line completed, another vehicle. This is a 2 mana 5-5 five five legendary vehicle at Mythic. It flies, but uh, if you look closely, there's no crew cost. So, how do we turn Weather Lines into a creature? Well, 
As long as it has four or more Phyrexian counters on it, it turns into a Phyrexian creature in addition to its other types, and whenever a creature you control dies, you can put one of those counters on the Weatherlight. You also get to draw a card if it has seven or more of those counters on it, if not, scry one. Yeah, this is not very good. Um, it's gonna take a long time before you can actually activate this. The one exception, I guess, is the Red White Legend, which gives all your vehicles crew one. But that's also a card that's very situational, so unless you happen to get both, uh, probably not interested in Weatherlight completed, as it's gonna take too long to actually turn it into a creature. So overall, give it a D rating. But uh, feel free to live the dream, either with a Red White Legend, or maybe in like a Sacrifice deck, Black White Tokens is probably your best bet. And now it's time for our lands. And I've grouped all the pain lands here, like a darker waste, into one, since we don't really need to go over every one individually. And yeah, these are rare lands, can tap for a colorless or for their respective colors at the cost of one life. Now, in the set, these pain lands are kind of awkward for limited in that they don't contribute towards your basic land types, so it's not very useful for domain. Fine in an aggressive two color deck, probably not something you want in your domain decks but can also help maybe splash some kicker abilities that you otherwise wouldn't get access to. So all the pain lands have given a cumulative C plus grade. And then all the basic lands with the basic land types, like the aquifer here, have given a C plus as well. These come into play tapped, that's the major drawback. But we've seen a few cards in the set that help us surge these up, even putting them into play tapped with the uh, Slimefoot's ramp spell, for instance. So that's a great way to increase your basic land types, sometimes by two with just one land, in this case Island Swamp, can uh, be very helpful for domain purposes. So there's 10 of these, so one for each color pair, and I could potentially give some of the green uh, dual lands an extra little bonus grade, since they're more likely to be useful in your domain decks, but really you're probably happy playing like a totally off-color land in those domain decks anyways, so it's probably not a huge factor whether or not the base color is green or not, but uh, yeah, maybe like a, a three-color, let's say a Naya domain deck doesn't want an aquifer, but is happy to have all the green, white, and red uh, dual lands, for instance, that remains to be seen. Next we have Crystal Grotto, a land that enters the battlefield tapped and lets us cry one, making a colorless, or we can pay one mana, tap it to add one mana of any color. So unlike the mana worker that we saw during the artifacts, this actually costs you one mana to fix your mana, so it's a bit worse in that regard. So we'll just give it a C. And Plaza of Heroes is a rare land, Enters untapped, can make a colorless or a man of any color that we can only spend to cast a legendary spell. Can also pay three mana, tap it and exile the plaza to give a legendary creature hexproof and indestructible until end of turn. That's probably the most relevant part of this uh, card, being able to save one of your key legendary creatures. Otherwise, probably not a card you need access to. So maybe the more dedicated decks that have lots of legendaries will appreciate the last ability. So overall, we'll give it a C. And Thran Portal is a gate, so could maybe play this in your gate synergy decks in older format. It's a rare land, and it's kind of like a fast land, and as it enters, you have to choose a basic land type, and the portal is the chosen type in addition to its other types, so it does actually help with domain. And sadly, it does also cost you one life to activate the Thran portal to make one mana. So, a bit of a weird land. We'll most definitely see some constructed play to help out multicolor mana bases. Um, as far as limited is concerned, having to pay the one life over and over adds up, but a domain deck might still be happy with it just because it gives you that added flexibility. So, Thran portal also gets a C. Okay, so that concludes our set review. Once again, I want to remind you that you can get access to the spreadsheet containing all the grades we've covered today, 
by subscribing on Twitch or becoming a supporter on Patreon. And then once you're there, you'll easily find links to it either through Discord or on Patreon itself. And uh, you'll get access to plenty of other benefits, including the set reviews I've covered in the past if you're interested in playing older formats as well. And I'll try to keep those spreadsheets up to date so you get the most accurate ratings as I explore the set a little bit more. And yeah, of course, a great help in supporting the channel as well. So lots to look forward to. But uh, for now, I want to thank everyone for watching. Hope you enjoyed. And as always, have a nice day. I also want to thank all my patrons for being part of the channel. And you can become a patron yourself today and decide the topic of future videos over at patreon.com forward slash legendvd.